The uh, welcome to this meeting of the Communities Committee. As you'll see, we've got a full business agenda to deal with today, and it is my intention to ensure we deal with this thoroughly in order to make important decisions that will deliver our Council's priorities and commitments. Um, I would advise the members that item 8, the Town Centre Living Fund report, will no longer consider the application for the clock tower in Castle Douglas, as this request has been withdrawn at this point. I'd also like to advise members I have one additional item of urgent business, which is a report on our twinning arrangements between Newton Stewart and Marcuses. Um, I think we'll circulate that uh, later and take uh, maybe five minutes to read it. Um, um, a key feature of the business plan has been the involvement of the staff communications team, and I'd like to extend a welcome to two of the staff who are on that team, uh, Kirsty McCrindle and Stephen Martin, um, who've come along to observe the committee and also take any questions from members, if members so wish. Um, Derek, is there something you want to intimate at this time? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Morning, members. Uh, apologies, uh, very late notice, but uh, technical information has just come to hand to me uh, last night in relation to item 14 uh, on the agenda, members. That's the Dumfries and Galloway region-wide community uh, fund, and therefore I have to withdraw that report, and I will brief members following the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And just to remind all members as well, this has been recorded for public uh, uh, public consumption or public use or listening to. All right. Um, we'll move to Cedric. Apologies. Uh, Claire, uh, you Cedric, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got 14 members present this morning. Six apologies from Councillors Bell, Blake, Campbell, Justy, Maitland and Marshall. And that's 15 members present now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, any declarations of interest? Ronnie? Yeah, um, item 8, Chair. Uh, I'm a director of the Astor Foundation and, and I also sit in the subgroup that's, that's taking the project forward. Can I just say also, Chair, that on page 201, 3.4.1, Astor Foundation have got four flats, not two. I will pick that up under the item. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, but are you, are you staying in the room for that uh, meeting? But you're giving us that information so that we can consider it at the time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? No. Um, in that case, then, I'll move on to item three, which is the minute of the meeting of the 5th of June. We're happy to know. Okay, thank you. Um, item four, the Communities Directorate Business Plan. Uh, up to, from this year up to 22-23, report by the Director. The Director has taken an innovative approach to the community's five-year plan, in particular the contributions throughout the business plan from staff on the communications team make it a more grounded document. Staff fully understand how their work delivers the Council priorities and commitments, helps them to better engage in the transformation of the Council. As well as staff, the business plan has also been shaped and influenced by our work with communities, a range of partner organisations, including Creative Scotland, Events Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, Health and Social Care Partnership, Third Sector, Dumfries and Galloway, Register Social Landlords, and colleagues in Police and Fire Services. And not forgetting the valuable involvement of the Tackling Poverty Reference Group and Equality Representative Organisations. The report and appendix provides members with the community's business plan for 2018-19 through to 2022 for approval. Um, Derek uh, will then take it from here, work our way through the plan, and uh, I'll hand you over to Derek. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as you can see, I will take in a bit of a novel approach, so we'll continue uh, with that theme. So before we take any questions, members, I would ask you to sit back, take a few minutes, <coughs> few minutes, and watch our latest video, which hopefully brings to life the business plan. Thank you. Thank you. Just... Uh, before I let Derek in, um, given the gender balance isn't a very good day, there's lots of pictures for the men to understand. Um, so on that, I'll hand you back to Derek. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. As I say, uh, nothing really more to add to the report. It's uh, deliberately a five-year business plan which has to take account of the significant challenges we know we are going to face and therefore uh, very optimistic that despite these challenges with the clear 
priorities and commitments set by the Council that we have a, a directorate geared up uh, to deliver on that challenge with the model that members have very much embraced. So very much uh, happy to hand over back to yourself, Chairman, take questions, acknowledging, as I say, that we have also two of the staff communications team uh, here today, but also the video uh, was home produced by our colleagues uh, in the Council's uh, graphics uh, and print team, so a fantastic job done in-house by the Council. And it was John Harvey from the staff communications team who works in cultural services who did the voiceover. Uh, so that's additional information. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, uh, Director. I'll move straight to questions. David. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, a lot more parties are recognising the opportunity for people to self-designate their gender. So it's probably a presumptuous of you to, to think that we're all of one gender here today. Um, I've written to you on community um, participation, um, which I, I don't fully understand, but I think is a programme whereby um, groups can um, apply to take over services or services that the council supplies and do it on a voluntary basis. I think it was alluded to in the, in the video there. Um, I've, I've written to you on this, um, asking what your views are concerning um, it not being purely voluntary or it being in part subsidized by the council. And I'm thinking <laughs> maybe of an activity that cost the council, um, uh, I don't know, 5,000 pounds a year. And a community might say, well, we can do that. Um, we'd like to look into doing that for 2,000. And um, could that be a win-win and a way, a new way of us doing business? I'm interested in your views and um, and any other councillors present. Um, I'll let Derek actually give you the, the chapter and verse on this one. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, indeed, we are in those challenging times, but uh, it's certainly not presumptuous of officers to believe that uh, in all cases, that's a road that the Council wants to go down. The Community Facilities Review, you're absolutely right, has taken an approach which is about uh, giving increased responsibility uh, to communities for the management of facilities and doing so on a partnership basis. That was an agreed Council position. So quite clearly, uh, if in developing budgets going forward, any political groups wish proposals uh, on that type of initiative for particular services, we'd be very much happy to help as clearly these are decisions which change the nature of services because clearly the delivery changes from being the council to other parties, and that's very much a, a council decision. And in the first instance, that can be brought forward by any group uh, as part of your budget and more than happy uh, to assist if that's a requirement. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. Rob? Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. I um, appreciated the, um, the video. I'm very glad that you both make it along. Welcome. Um, I wanted to, to ask, I guess, in particular, because I'm interested in um, what the business plan means to the folk who are doing the work. Um, so I, I guess my question was, how, uh, how important is it that the, the staff, as I say, the folk who are actually going to deliver the business plan, that you're all involved in it? And, and, I, and I guess what your experience of that has been? Thank you. Um, as part of the staff communication group, we've been involved right from the beginning, um, and we've been asked to contribute, asked to take views from our colleagues and feed those back through the staff communication group. There's been um, opportunities for all co all of my colleagues to um, to comment and view on how we feel we can be part of the Council's priorities um, and protect our, our work in the homeless service. So um, on a daily basis, I help to protect the most vulnerable people of our communities, um, and I feel very empowered by being asked to be part of this staff communication group and also um, seeing it through to, to ultimately the end here. I, I'm a street scene operative and I formally come for ground maintenance, so this was a complete new challenge to us. But over the last 18 months, the changes that have happened within my department, how we address everything, and seeing this here working and how we're involved in it, we've always been involved that have actually been asked about it. We deliver services to vulnerable people in this region eh, and for visitors to the region. You know, we deal with parks, schools, garden maintenance for elderly people. So I think it's important that we've got a bit of input to this. And hopefully, it'll be good. 
If I could come back. Just, just very briefly, Chair. Uh, Rob, you want to back in? With your leave, Chairman, thank you very much. Really appreciated the feedback, um, and I think it's an approach that could do well to be replicated in the other directorates of the Council. It would strike me as being a, a good idea. That's not a matter for the committee here, but I think nevertheless worth putting on the record. I think it's a really good way of doing things. Um, I, I agree entirely with you, and I know that uh, it's been held up as an example of good practice uh, Scotland-wide. Um, so there's a huge thank you to that whole uh, the, through the director, that whole uh, organisation, um, as we obviously have hard times here and some hard decisions to make, so it's absolutely crucial that the staff are involved in that all the way through, buy into it. Um, John, you want in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. A very impressive video. Thank you for that. Um, I also note from reading that you have a staff newsletter, which I presume is just limited to communities. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little more about that and... Um, would it be possible for elected members to have sight of copy? Um, the staff newsletter um, is, is what it says, basically. It's for all staff to contribute, um, and it's an opportunity for us to celebrate um, both personal and work achievements. Um, every month, people are asked to um, put articles in or achievements, and, and a focus has been on staff and getting to know each other within the directorate as well so it's not just purely for um for business you know it's it's about celebrating achievements out with work as well um and it's everybody's asked to contribute and and the contribution rate has really increased hasn't it and it's seen it something we look forward to seeing it every every month now and absolutely i'm i'm sure we would be happy to share that with you if you'd like to see that yeah and the staff newsletter also gets distributed to all the staff which we've got staff in very rural locations. Some staff work part time, some work weekends. So it's difficult to see everybody. But the people who don't email, we actually get it hand delivered to them. So everybody's involved and everybody gets an opportunity to contribute to it. So, so it is a printed copy as well as a digital copy? Yes. It is, yes. yes. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask the two reps, you know, just two seconds, John. Um, ask the two reps uh, if, uh, if, if we're minded, can you actually circulate on a, an issue by issue basis to the members of the committee? Or you want to go all 43 members? I, I mean, it's up to people whether they read it or not. Of course, they, can, we can't make them do that, but if they've all got a copy, so I'm, I'm sure through the director we can arrange um, for that to be available for all 43 members to read and see. And uh, I think they're absolutely right. Um, is there anyone else got any questions? Uh, Ian? Just a quick point, I suppose, just to thank staff as well. It was a good video, excellent first class, and maybe we should send the message back to through our representatives here to, to the rest of the staff, and that we're proud of them and, and absolutely what they've achieved. The second part, just a quick question on page 12. Just one point just to pick up on is, I suppose we're looking at it as well. It's just about the number of ward events across the Priest and Galloway. So, how, what does that actually mean in regards to that uh, key performance indicator? Again, it talks about ward events. We can come to our own, our own view in regards to what that is. There's 18, I think it's asking for saying across the whole, uh, all, all 11 wards, or, or 12 wards, sorry. Chairman, just what, what, what does that actually mean in regards to, and how meaningful really actually are they? Just as a, I think we need to ask something of the, the business plan. I'll get Derek to answer that for you. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Carruthers. Uh, the ward events uh, were agreed as part of the, the reshape uh, that we agreed, uh, I think, 18 months ago at full council. And uh, it's been one of these developments that we always knew was going to take a bit of time to warm up. And now, indeed, it is warming up. And uh, the best example I'll give you was in the Nith, uh, not in the Nith ward. Check my uh, geography. Um, I'm looking at the Provost Locker, thank you, Provost, and in the Locker Ward, where uh, I believe uh, the issue raised by the community, and uh, more than happy to, to bow to the Provost uh, and other members in that ward, but in essence, the ward event uh, was uh, initiated by the local community. It was in relation to road safety concerns on, in this case, and I believe the event was chaired by Councillor Charteris and attracted at least uh, 60 people uh, from the local community 
and there was a meaningful dialogue uh, with officers and the community. So that's, in essence, the word event. It's for communities, it's for elected members to come forward. The procedure's there. Happy to recirculate that, members, if that's uh, helpful. And as I say, there are two or three others in the offing as well. So equally happy if another member wants to come in who was actually there and add any value to what I've said. More than happy to do so, Chairman. Um, thanks, Derek. Um, I've got two... Was it on that, on that same thing, Ian? Yeah, well, just, yeah, no, thanks. I'm aware of that. He no, no, very, if, very it's some, if it's someone else, there's somebody else first. All right, okay. Okay, right, okay. Um, uh, John? Thanks, Chair. It's just, uh, I say, myself and the Chair were along at one of your staff uh, communications meeting. We found it very beneficial with the questions and answers, the questions and other answers back there. So I'm just taking a chance here to get a wee bit more in back. <laughs> Uh, how, have you, <laughs> how do you think he's a benefited for the communications plan and what benefits do we think the staff communications team attending management development uh, sessions get from that? Thank you. Um, I think it allows us the opportunity to see from both sides. You know, we can see from our colleagues and, and being on the ground, but also see it from management's perspective. Um, and I think it gives us the opportunity um, to develop our own skills, um, but also feedback. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, do you want to take over? Please? Oh, on my level, this is a completely new thing to me. So, as so, and I take everything back to my staff. So we are all involved in it. So we are, it's not just one person. I share as much as I can with them. It's been right for the start of joining the staff communication team. Everything's virtually new to us, and this director has been a street scene operative. So, hope that helps. <laughs> He says it in the name of the staff communications, as long as they're getting communications back, I think that's one of the things that really, really is important that it's communicated back yeah. to everyone. Uh -huh. I think we've been been fortunate that we've spoke to the two selves, we've spoke to all the heads of departments, and the last person who was in it with getting interviewed or drilled, whatever way you look at it, was a young girl who's Amy. She was a council graduate. It was just inspiring to hear what she's got to say and what she, how she views the council. So we've been lucky to meet all these people. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ian. Yeah, just on the same point, I heard about the, the world event. It was very successful, I heard, but like say, Derek said, it's 18 months into that. I thought that's what we're talking about. And I suppose we do have to ramp that up. And we've got a target there, obviously, now of 18, so we can check that on an annual basis. Thanks, Ian. Um, Tracy, and then uh, did you want back in as well, John? And then John, and then Inc. will wind it up. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to add to what the um, Director said um, in answer to um, Councillor Carruthers' question, we had seven to one members of the public at that. I was, ast I was astounded at the amount of people that came along. We did a site, vi a site visit. It was about road safety in Turtherald and Colin, and we had a site visit to which uh, members of the public were really grateful that we went and actually saw all the different issues. We knew about them, but just for them to see us being there was good. And we've had evaluation forms everyone filled in. Most people filled in at the end of the evening, which have come up with 100% um, felt that the objective was achieved, 100% agreed and strongly agreed that the staff were helpful, 100% agreed that the day and time of the venue was right, we had 90% felt they were, the information provided was, was good, and then 100% agreed with, that they had a chance to be, have the input and that they were listened to. So, um, yeah, this was really beneficial. For the first time, a lot of people, there was no negativity in the room. They came there, there was a little bit of tension. They felt like, you know, they were ready for a little bit of a fight. But, um, they were so open, the officers that were there were so helpful, Derek Hexel was so helpful. Um, we answered all questions and for the first time, 100% said for the first time they felt like actually they were being listened to. So I, I'm really looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. <laughs> okay.
Okay, um, John and then Andrew and then... Uh, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Looking at some of the numbers, page 90. Page 90 near the bottom, you've got payments to other bodies, other agencies under events of £471,000. Page 90, about five lines from the bottom, left-hand side, right-hand side, sorry. Payments to other bodies, other agencies, £471,000. I'm wondering if that is restricted to the seven um, major events that the council supports, or is it? Does it include other events? If it's just the seven signature events, it's almost seventy thousand pounds per event, or am I misreading that figure? So, so basically, John, you're wanting clarification of what that? I, I would that, like that, clarification. That, that, that yes. for? Um, can you give that the day, Derek? Or yeah. it, yeah. Harry's in just now, yeah. Uh, yes, Jill, that, that covers payments uh, to the seven signature events as well as to the uh, events funded through the Major Events Strategic Fund. It will also include the events funded through the uh, Events Growth Fund, which is uh, subject to consideration uh, elsewhere on the agenda today. Uh, and it also includes payments to uh, bodies on, on behalf of whom the Council sells uh, tickets. So it's, it's not simply those events that are sponsored through the Events Fund, which is a, a total of £275,000, but it also includes uh, those bodies for whom we sell tickets, uh, and, and uh, we take the income and then pay the, the money to the events. OK, John. Uh, would it be possible to have a breakdown of these figures sent to me? Yeah, sure, we can circulate a breakdown of that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Andrew? Uh, thank you, Chair. It was just to uh, build on, we are talking about the ward events, and I, I'm, I must say I'm looking forward to up in this deal, one is when it takes place. But when there are actions that come out of these, how do we uh, feed back to those that have participated so that they get you know, the, the sort of outcomes that they're looking for? The other thing that I was also interested in, and I'm delighted that we've got some of our staff here and how they've they, you know, built into what we're trying to do here, and it's how do we as elected members build on that so that we have a closer relationship with our staff because it seems that we're quite siloed we have you know the elected members you have the directorate and then you have the staff and i understand and fully appreciate there's operational issues that you, you can't get into that but it's about trying to build on that joint working approach thank you chairman thanks councillor wood uh, Firstly, in terms of uh, the detail, you're absolutely right. The ward events, as uh, the provost has indicated, is there's an evaluation. But what's important is that there's then clarity on what's going to come out of it. And that forms very much part of the feedback and the ongoing communication. So it's certainly not about a ward event being held and we all leave and uh, never to be seen again. The critical thing is closing that circle. And firstly, the issue being raised. And then secondly, monitoring progress. And the more we do these, the more we will learn, and I'm sure the more they, they will uh, improve and have impact. So very much, as we've said, early days, uh, very keen to, to learn from them, and uh, we'll build uh, any improvements in as we regularly bring monitoring reports back to this committee. In terms of the, the second point, uh, I would always welcome uh, member uh, input with the services, and uh, at a ward level, uh, we'll be commencing the, the ward visit soon, which covers part of that, but also uh, we've always uh, been keen if they want to arrange uh, member visits to any of the facilities, either at a corporate level, such as the contact centre, which has impact across Dumfries and Galloway, or more specific to your ward, uh, we're more than uh, willing to organise these, as I say, on a regional basis, on an award basis. So what I'm happy to do following the meeting is draw up a kind of uh, options list and get some feedback from members and we can take that forward. And at the heart of that would be the staff themselves. So just to reaffirm that that's the, the key point we're trying to develop here. It's the frontline staff who engaged with communities, likewise with elected members as well. So that's a direction of travel I'd very much welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Um, no other questions. Um, just a final comment from me, I think. Sorry? Uh, Ian, you want back in? Uh, it, is, it is in the recommendations here, so I can wait till then, but... If you've got the name, the name's 2.2. I'm looking to get in on, please. 
you want to give us a clue first? Uh, just it's the, we're going through a budget process, and I just see we did it in policy and resources on Tuesday as well, but we agreed the budget here today as well. Uh, just the difference between what we did in, just if you could explain the difference between what we did in February and what, we do, what we're doing now, please. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll cover that just in a minute or two. I think, um, back to me, I hung off here a wee bit, I think it'd be remiss if I didn't actually commend everybody involved in this process of putting this together. I've received some tremendous compliments from elected members from across the chamber about the seminar. And just Maybe it was because I was in Cornwall at the time, <laughs> it ran better. Um, uh, but I've had nothing but good news stories from that and the inclusiveness and openness of that whole process. And uh, I thank the elected members who actually took the time to tell me that. Um, so I'm now publicly passing that on to the uh, food director staff um, to thank them for their involvement and thank particularly the two who've come along today to help us. Um, it makes them feel as though they're part of a process here. Um, they're not the process, they're part of it, right? So, um, again, to the two of you in particular, thank you. Um, so, are we ready to go to the recommendations? I would suggest we are. Um, we're asked to agree one, the, the community business plan for 1819 to 22 23. We have agreed. And the community's budget to 1819 um, is appendix uh, annex two of the appendix. Now, Ian, you wanted to say something, yeah? The difference between what we agreed in February and what we're agreeing now, please. The difference? Well, no, we agreed, I take it this is not exactly the same as what we agreed in February. Just the difference. Obviously, we agreed the budget in February time, February, March, as we always do every year. And it's quite detailed in regards to what we agree. And here we look to be agreeing that something very similar context. Again, I just wondered what the procedure I should have really picked up yeah, yeah. this on Tuesday, but I, I hadn't picked up on it there with Paulson and Resource. Just an explanation on about that, please. If possible, if we need a financial person, we'll get it offline, but looking for that question to be answered. Derek will take that. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Carruthers. In very simple terms, the Council agreed, as you indicate, the budget in February. This process is ensuring that uh, the usual uh, administrative updates that finance colleagues do, and I'm quite happy for you to pick that up in detail with them offline, but in essence, uh, it is now our budget for each directorate. It comes to committees. There's been a question about the budget today, so it's an open and meaningful way of ensuring that ultimately each service has a confirmation of its budget. The budget is what was set in February, let's be absolutely clear about that, but as always, there are these uh, administrative refinements, and uh, therefore, this is now the budget I am working with and uh, therefore will deliver against that and be held to account uh, through monitoring that budget. Thank you. Ian. So just on the back of that, that answer, I wonder, is there any points, Derek, that you should be highlighting to the, to the committee today that's different from what we agreed in the budget setting time? Uh, it's not, no difference from what you agreed. Uh, there, there will be the, the technical updates, which I, I wouldn't uh, claim to give you all the detail of. It would be inappropriate for me to do so. But it's uprating all the usual factors that our colleagues in finance do. Uh, there's nothing uh, unusual about that. It's standard practice. I'm more than happy uh, for finance colleagues to give you a, an explanation of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're past discussion. We're at uh, uh, recommendations. Have you a recommendation? No, that's okay. We'll move on then. David, I'm sorry. We, we, we've, we've kicked this about for 40 minutes, right? And uh, yes, it's very important, everything else. If you have a specific question, do it through Derek um, and we'll get something dealt with later. I'm not cutting down the debate here because we've passed the debate stage. We've moved to the recommendations. Yeah. Um, so Ian was allowed in because he asked a pertinent question on the recommendations um, and asked for some clarification. So unless it's on the recommendations, we move on. That's right. I'd like to know if we're in any way bound by our commitment here to uh, understood 2023, because obviously we voted against the budget that was agreed, and um, I'm worried that we've now com we're now committing as far as 2023, and we'd hope to be the administration long before then. So, I, I, just for the clarification there, uh, it's, it's no competent because the um, the finance uh, we're agreeing here today is only for this financial year. It's not for up to 2023. That's a separate budget setting process. No for here today, right? Um, okay, so are we happy with the recommendations? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Move on. Thank you everybody for uh, all their input into this. Okay, move on to uh, move on to item five, the revenue monitoring report. 
The uh, report provides members with an overview of the financial performance against budget for communities for the period to the 30th of June. It is pleasing to note the work that has been undertaken by the management team to ensure we are balancing the books. Uh, Derek will take any questions on the report and I will now move on to the recommend. Sorry, um, <laughs> a bit in front of myself there. Um, so Derek, it's across to you. Brought Kirk along as our finance officer who would equally be able to help with any questions, members, but it's a, a straightforward monitoring report. Uh, it's early days, so we will not uh, be presumptuous. It's a uh, sound position, but nothing more than that. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, have we, have we any questions on the first two or three months of the financial year? Ian? I think to be congratulated in real terms in regards to the 71k potential underspend, but at the same time, an underspend, there's a lot of grass cutting. That's something one cake could do a lot of grass cutting, grave digging and so on and so forth, but first quarter. So it's not only really a criticism, but obviously just an observation in regards to the nearer it is to zero the better. But big budget, very, very, like I said, I think is to be commended in regards to the performance up to now. So but that's something one cake can do a lot of community work at the same time. Okay, thanks, Ian. Hey, Derek? There was, there was no question there. Nothing to add, Chairman. We, shall we are happy to, to note um, based on the monitoring position at the end of June, communities are projecting an underspend of 71k. Uh, progress against the delivery of the agreed savings applied in the 2018-19 communities budget, Appendix 2, and 3. Progress on the delivery of policy development initiatives excluded, uh, sorry, included within communities budget in Appendix 3. Right, agreed. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item 6. Uh, homeless service, so this is a response to the homelessness and rough sleeping uh, action group report, uh, which is by the head of customer services. Um, in actual fact, it's Lorna here. The council remains determined to tackle homelessness and report provides members with the proposed response to the re recommendations from the homelessness and rough sleeping action group report for improving housing options and homeless services. It also seeks members' approval for changes to the current temporary accommodation rent charging models. I've got Lorna here um, to take any questions in the report. Lorna, you anything you want to add? Um, thanks, Chair. Just one thing to add. I had notification yesterday um, there's been a slight change to the deadline for the submission for the Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan. Um, it's just moved from the 15th of December to the 31st of December, so it's, it's not a huge move, but it's, it's some movement. Okay, thank you. Have we any... Any questions? Andrew? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. It's with regard to homelessness, when you have an eviction that takes place and that obviously that person has to vacate the premises, there will be items of personal belongings, etc. Are the costings of that in included within uh, what we're doing here or not? Or is that picked up by that person themselves when they have to put it in storage? Okay, thanks. It really depends on where someone's facing eviction. If they then come to homelessness, there's an assessment made whether they're intentional or unintentionally homeless. Um, where they're unintentional, then the council has a statutory duty to find them um, accommodation. Um, if they're in temporary accommodation and they have to store furniture, then that's a cost we meet in the service if the person themselves can't, can't afford to meet that cost. It, it's not that we would automatically remove furniture whether there's an eviction. It would really depend if they're presented as homeless and what the state of their homeless application was. Anyone else? No. In that case, I'll go straight to the recommendations. Um, we're asked to agree the partnership approach being taken to produce a robust uh, rapid uh, rehousing transition plan, the RRTP, as paragraphs 3.5 to 3.7. Note the significant contribution this plays in achieving the Council's priority to protect the most vulnerable and the need for partner participation in developing a deliverable and effective plan, and two, the proposed reductions to temporary accommodation rent charges from the effect of 1st of October, in support of the Council's strategic priority to protect the most vulnerable and contribute to the anti-poverty ag agenda, which is paragraphs 3.13 to 3.14. Happy to get... Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to item 7, the Strategic Housing Investment Plan, Report by again the head of customer services and uh, okay members are asked to agree a number of new projects to be included in the council's strategic housing investment plan, better known as the SHIP, 
and to remove developments that registered social landlords are unable to take forward within the plan. The Council is committed to delivering new affordable homes and the ship reinforces our determination to deliver on this. Um, we've got uh, quite an array here, um, people in here to help support. Um, Jim O'Neill will take uh, the main questions on the report. Um, Jim, have you anything you want to add? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just to say that we've got Mark Whittock here from DGHP and Graeme Robertson from Lordburn Housing Association to help answer any detailed delivery questions that members may have. And unfortunately, Cunningham Housing Association were invited, but we're unable to get someone here today. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move to questions. Uh, Ian. Okay, thanks, Chairman. Just probably started. Good to see you, Max, here, because I've got a particular question on about, about DGHP. It's on page 188. Don't know if you've got the report, Mark. It's, it talks about East Riggs and Aries, ERL.H1 Gilwood Road. I've had this conversation for a number of years now. I know it's been submitted in regards to the local development plan. I think it's been agreed as a potential housing site, but for a member uh, with a working group with the council, we spoke to the minister at the time, and there was a caveat in there, because it was, it was, that was a site we were actually focusing on at the time as part of the discussion. There was a caveat in regards to when DGHP was formed that they had to pay back X amount of money if they were to develop on their own land. And this was excluded. And at that time, the Minister, there was no intention whatsoever to change that. So it just around about the de deliverability of that particular site. It's in my own word, Mark. I've brought this up numerous occasions uh, in, in the past. It just, it's a, I just I don't know if it's absolutely deliverable. So it's a question maybe wider as well, beyond DGHP, maybe to Jim as well, in regards to that, the, the, the ability to actually deliver that site. Um, is Mark going to pick that up or are you pick it up, Jim? I'd probably pick up the kind of strategic part of it first, Chair, if you don't mind. In terms of uh, proposals that are brought in front of members to be included in the Strategic Housing Investment Plan, uh, we consult with colleagues in strategic planning in the economy, environment and infrastructure and colleagues in development management. And one of the, the, the things that we consider uh, is compliance with current planning policy and deliverability, and they've been consulted in the, the preparation of this report, and their view is that the, the, the project is able to be delivered from a strategic perspective. But I'll hand over to Mark to answer any questions you have about the, 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 the site itself. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Crothers, um, I'm not entirely sure uh, whether there's any payback to the government for land banks as such. There was definitely a a question on any other disposals that involved properties that were acquired at transfer, but that's something we need to take back and see if that argument has progressed any further. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, given this, this question, you've asked two or three times, Ian, isn't it? So, just, um, that, that's but I think if, if, I mean, that'd be great if, if Mark could actually go back and address that and we'll get some kind of feedback. But like, again, we spoke with the Minister at the time, it was quite clear that, that was right through because of the level of debt that was written off. It was any money would be to repay the, the I think it was over £100 million worth of debt written off when DGHP was formed eh, on behalf of the council. So that caveat was there. And, and when it came to DGHP, they've got a real problem. That's been quite open eh, about that for a number of years in regards to building on their own land. Difficult, we, we said there was a lot of opportunity if, there were, if the Scottish Government at the time would look at that and actually reverse that decision, because then it would have been far more feasible, I think, for eh, or achievable for DGHP in particular to achieve to build more affordable stroke social housing, but uh, certainly if we didn't mind, Chair, get the feedback on that, we'd be much appreciated, but certainly that point, and if that is the case, if I'm correct, I think we need to revisit likes of that site there in particular. Um, thanks, uh, Mark, and feedback through Jim, and then for Jim, through to the elected members of the committee, and through the normal process, is that okay? Um, yes. Yeah. Just, just to say there, Jim? that we work very closely as well, Chair, with the Scottish Government when we're taking the uh, are developing the report to come in front of the Communities Committee and we'll pick up that issue with the Scottish Government as well. But there's been no indication at this stage that there's an issue there in relation to the receipt. Um, okay, well, I'm wondering here, do we deal with that as a briefing note coming back to members, Derek, when it's the, the finish that one? Yeah. No, it seems very reasonable. We'll arrange to do that, Chairman. It's a good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Dempster. Hey, thanks, Chair. Uh, and uh, just reiterating the discussions I've had with Mark and just looking for some reassurance 
I would have to say both Mark and Jim have been very good recently. Uh, Jim O'Neill has been excellent in supporting me through this. This old school in Sankar seems to just roll on in the ship every year. I think it's been in five now consecutive years. Mark's organisation has had it in their portfolio for three. It's a disaster, it's a derelict building, it's an eyesore, it's all the things that we don't want to see in our communities. And Mark has been keeping me up to date, to be fair to Mark, on uh, where the GHP are with this site. And I'm just looking for him today to reassure me that 2018-19 will be the last time we'll see this appear on the ship and that it will indeed be developed when Mark assured me it would be. Um, I, I'm not sure that Mark can actually uh, speak on behalf of the board of DGHP, but I'm sure he'll inform me and tell us or give us some explanation. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I can certainly give you the detail on the site that we've actively been pursuing, Jim, uh, for the last, well, five years at least. But in the last 12 months, we've been very much uh, chasing it down. Um, we got planning permission back in March of this year. And since then, there was a couple of issues uh, with roads, issues that have come out. Uh, one being that the road and the parking that was proposed is actually still on council land. Uh, now, members might not uh, realise that this was purchased with some council contribution as well, so it's very much a partnership project. And we've, we've met with the assets and estates team within the council, and the reason I've not updated you is because it was only last week, Jim, we met with... Um, Alistair from the estates team and what we're hoping to do is build the adoptable road in the front of the scheme uh, on the council land so the issue is for the council it becomes almost like a disposal now that disposal has to go to the asset committee on the 13th so that's that's the latest uh, kick of the ball if you like and once that has happened it's full steam ahead with the tender getting a contractor on board. So everything else is in place. Pleased yeah. to hear it, Chair. And I hope that uh, our committee are sympathetic to this appeal because uh, or this application because it is something that the Council is working in partnership with DGHP with. And it's indeed important to the community to get rid of, rid of a derelict and dangerous building. And I'm sure the committee will conduct them the way I hope they would. Okay, thanks, Jim. John? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Page 190. Cunningham Housing Association have asked that the King Street Castle Douglas project be removed from the ship. I presume that's Hawks Garage premises in King Street. I just wondered if there's any background and why that's been removed, because it's just lying empty. Jim, can you take that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Generally, the reason the sites are requested to be removed from the ship is because the RSL has been unable to secure purchase of the site from the property owner. Uh, another reason can be that they've assessed the site in terms of deliverability and they're unable to deliver in the Scottish Government's cost benchmarks. But ultimately, decisions on delivery, once the ship's been agreed by the Council, are taken by RSL boards and development proposals have to be compatible and be deliverable within their business plan. So we're very much guided by decisions that they make. Thank you. I'm okay with that, John, yet. Yeah. Rob? Thank you, Chairman. Looking at paragraph 3.4 in the uh, ship uh, outturn position, I mean, without a doubt, there's a significantly improving trend here. I mean, if we're looking at increases from where we started, 7.3 million, then 8.1, then up to 9.9 .9 as the financial years are rolling on, and the the projected indication that a huge leap from 9.9 .9 up to 19 and just well just under 19.3 million um, in terms of that being very nearly um, the the full the, the, the full utilisation of the, the the RPA allocation, which is possibly the first time we've managed that. I mean, it's it's very very good news indeed, um, and and I warmly welcome it. Of course, I've got to ask the question as well. It is a projection. Um, what's the kind of level of confidence in it. I mean, obviously things can, can crop up or there can be unforeseen circumstances, but I guess how, how, how can a solid a projection is that? I mean, it's still going to be a substantial increase, I suspect, but you know, how close are we going to get to the 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, we work very closely, obviously, with our RSL partners and the Scottish Government and are constantly seeking updates in relation to the de deliverability of the projects within the Strategic Housing Investment Plan. I think what we would say is, at this point in time, we are confident that that delivery target will be reached. Uh, within the report as well, we're also looking for additional projects to be included. That's because the Scottish Government looks for us to build additional capacity within the programme. The purpose of that is that should a development hit difficulties, another one can be brought forward to take up uh, the, the slack that's created. But we're actively managing the programme with the Scottish Government, with our RSL partners. Uh, development's not an exact science, so there are projections, and uh, as members will realise, uh, developments can often hit complications, either through the development process itself, through the planning application process, or in relation to constraints that are uncovered on any given site. But what we do through the development forum is actively manage the programme. And I would say that maybe going back, I don't know, about five, six years ago, our outturn was somewhere around £4 million a year. So the fact that we're now achieving spend this year, or last year, should I say, of £9.9 .9 million, I think is a huge leap forward. And it's now uh, the, the capacity that we've built into the process in terms of the number of sites that we've got included and the, the addition of Cunningham Housing Association is now beginning to pay dividends. So it is a projection. We're confident that it will be achieved. But development is notoriously difficult to say with absolute certainty it will happen. But we'll, we'll all be working hard to try and make sure that we, we achieve the best outcome possible. OK. Any more questions? No. So the debate's over. We'll move to the recommendations. Um, one, uh, we're asked to note the resource planning assumptions for the Fishing Galloway for the period 2018 to 2020-21. Okay, noted. Uh, note the investment projections for 2018-19 currently indicate that there will be 421 unit site starts and 174 completions, which will fully utilise the allocated funding of 19.279 million. Note the strategic housing investment plan out on position for 2017-18. Um, agreed to include in the, the ship the new sites contained in the report. Uh, agreed to remove the projects that our development partners no longer consider deliverable within the plan. Um, and 2.6, consider the transfer of Park Place Lockerbie project from Cunningham and Oil Depot Terrell Road de Vries from Lourburn Housing Association to Building Craftsman. Okay. We're happy. Uh, agreed. Uh, Ian, is it on the recommendations? No, it's, it's just subject to a query in regards should, should, should or could we even have another one in regards to, so happy with all the recommendations put forward, agree with them for sure. Come back to, we're on an upper trend when it comes to delivering affordable housing. Uh, 2008 9, I think we were only second to Glasgow, believe it or not, as a local housing authority, and, and because of North West and Freeze, Dix Hill in particular, over in Stranraer. But heading in that direction, we've got our own in-house team and our partners working very well together, obviously, by that, that head in, in that upper direction. I do feel now, I always have felt, that this actually merits its own subcommittee. So is that something we can actually look at here, a further report, <coughs> a subcommittee? I mean, I do think having a housing subcommittee of communities would be a fantastic idea. Uh, it worked very well in the past, and when that committee was there, actually, and it was formed, that's when we actually performed at our highest level. Like, we're second across Scotland, all 32 local authorities, only second to Glasgow. So. Is that something we could consider or even bring forward as an agenda item? Um, I think your point's got merit, but it's not competent here today because we're not in a position to do that. So I think um, we'll t I'll note what you're saying. We can talk out outside the room, and um, obviously there are other avenues within the council to, to go down here. I'm not wanting to I'm going to a debate over this because I'm, I'm saying you've got merit in what you say, OK? But we're not in a position today to make a decision, and we're at decision-making time now. So... Yeah. Um, I, I um, suppose, I mean, if, if the clarity is what you're saying, sure, it's, it, it wouldn't be common at this moment yeah. in time. Fine, but well, I think, it, couldn't we ask for the report, have a talk out with, maybe to try and chivvy that on if possible, if it's actually possible. I see Claire taking lots of notes. So happy to have that discussion with I you say, afterwards. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to assure you that we can have that discussion outside the Chamber, because it's not on the agenda today and it's not appropriate. Right? But it's an appropriate thing to talk about. Absolutely. Get that. OK, so happy with that? OK, in that case, then... Um, we'll move on. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, just thank you for your 
uh, Dennis, you're the two, yeah. uh, two guys, and um, also uh, all the hard work that's gone into putting this together. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on now to item eight, the Town Centre Living Fund. Um, and uh, if you remember at the start of the meeting, I advised members that the uh, the clock tower in Castle Douglas um, has has um, been withdrawn by the applicants um, at this point. Okay, just to remember uh, to remember that the report asked members to consider the applications for funding from the council's town centre living fund, which was previously agreed as part of our budget development process. Um, I've got Jamie Little here and Jim O'Neill who will um, answer any questions if necessary. Um, I have to say, I'm particularly pleased to see that there's a spread across the region here, um, uh, which is good. So, uh, Jamie, have you anything to add to the report? Thanks, Joe. Nothing to add. Thank you very much. Uh, good questions? Oh. Chairman, welcome to the geographic spread, just as you've uh, outlined. Happy to move recommendations. Thanks very much. Right, we're happy to agree the recommendations. That, that was short and sweet. Thank you very much. Um, so we are um, agreeing the allocation of 60k for the Old Bank in Wigton uh, High Street, uh, 90k for the former police station in Langham, um, an allocation of 98696 for the Cars Billet in St. Nannan, <laughs> an allocation of 103 for uh, Castle Street Dumfries, and note the funding allocations will enable the delivery of projects with a total value of um, well, it would be 3.4 million now, it will be 3.4 minus 70k. Okay, so we happy to agree that? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Can somebody get uh, Ronnie back in? Can, can you let Ronnie know? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, boys. Um, okay, we'll go on to item 9. Oh, uh, uh, Ronnie can catch up with us. It's, uh, okay, we're at item nine, uh, tackling poverty budget decided by participating budgeting. Our council values the involvement of our communities in prioritising the activities that they value the most. This work embraces our council plan commitment to participating budgeting. The report asks members to agree the outline criteria for allocating the target po tackling poverty funding for 2018-19. Which will be, which is to be decided by by PB, as well as the timeline for taking forward the PB exercise. Um, Harry Hayes here to take any questions on the report. Um, Harry, have you anything to add? No, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thought that, Jim. Okay. Hey, thanks, Chair. Maybe, maybe an observation, maybe rather a question. We're talking three one six and page two three eight about. Uh, new web-based technology, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see that face-to-face uh, -face engagement and networking are, are still approaches we'll use. Early information regarding the PB process is made well available is also important. I took the opportunity to visit two projects in my ward last time after the PB process took place, and they assured me that they had no knowledge of, of, of the scheme. Now, that's maybe their fault and no others, but I'm keen to make sure it's the highest SIMD area in the whole of the region in Scotland. In fact, it's the fifth highest. And for no projects coming forward with that area at all, there is something fundamentally wrong. And if it's our fault, I'll try and fix it along with my council colleagues. But we need to make sure that these organisations are made aware of the opportunity because they claim, when I spoke to them, they didn't have that information to hand last year. And I'm sure that'll not be the case this year. It's a learning process. I appreciate that. But we need to make sure these organisations are aware of the opportunity. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Harry, can you take that? Yep. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, as members will see it, 323 three, in terms of the timetable, there's huge emphasis put on awareness raising, profile raising, and information sharing. So, absolutely confident uh, any, uh, any community will know exactly what the opportunities are. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Chair. Um, just say, I mean, last year was the first go. You know, and we, we learn from that and we take it forward, absolutely. Uh, uh, Ian? Thanks, Chair. I mean, well done in the last year. First go out right enough. So it was, it was kind of, it was good to see it up and implemented. I think it's certainly most councils are behind the ethos or the principle of participatory budgeting. 
Some of the queries I've certainly had in the past, and I'm looking at uh, recommendation 2.3, I wonder if you should maybe expand on that, Harry. Just note the ongoing work with the community planning partners to promote the use of, of participate, participatory budgeting, but also the process, voting and so on and so forth, because there was some some wild remarks, you could say, in regards to people being busted in and so on and so forth. So I just wondered how we're moving forward in regards to how we get that democratic, you could say, voice heard across the whole regions when we're going so if for Annandale and Estill, how people in Moffat can vote for a project in their area or in Langham or Gretna or Annan, wherever it may be, Lockerbie, etc. So I just, the criticism I certainly got <coughs> from members of the public and heard members of council uh, talking about was actually that dem seemed to be a democratic deficit when some folk were getting busted in for particular projects and it seemed to be uh, heavily weighed towards that. I mean, for a first year, first go, well done is what I say, Ken. It's, it's good to get the first year over, but I think it needs to evolve and change. OK, I think it's bad that organisations bust in supporters. Oh, no. um, just before you answer, Harry, um, John and I were at a participatory budgeting event at COSLA, um, and one of the things that came out of that is it's not just councils who are in for participatory budgeting. So a lot of your strategic partners haven't yet got to, to grips with this, um, and that's including the fire and rescue, it's including the police, it's including the NHS, God for... Oh, oh, I'm on camera here, I better be careful, right, but we can't um, take this on ourselves. You're absolutely right, it's a whole of the community that needs to get involved in this. So every service that the, that the public get um, should be included in participatory budget in one form or another. And it's not always about transferring money, you know, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Harry, you want to answer the specific question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just, just briefly, I, mean, I think participatory budgeting is a new concept in Scotland as a whole, but I'm certainly uh, very confident that in Dumfries and Galloway we've got to, to grips with it very quickly. We've been through the whole process. Um, the recommendations in front of members this morning are, are, are based on the robust analysis we did last time round. Um, and just you know, in terms of transparency, obviously that's absolutely critical. Uh, and the point was made earlier about um, voting options, both face-to-face, -face, in person, and indeed um, web-based as well. So we want to try and make sure that uh, um, there's nobody out there that can actively get involved uh, in the process. And I think inevitably, because of community enthusiasm for the projects are taking forward, they're naturally going to try and drum up interest and support uh, uh, throughout the region, um, which is an important part of it. It's about informing the voting public as much as, as anything else, but I'm certainly confident that the arrangement we've got um, moving forward um, will address uh, th th those points, Councillor Cross. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks very much, uh, Harry. I've got uh, Adam and then David James. Thanks, Chair. Kind of building action on the point that, that Ian made, certainly in, in Angela Nestel, I was most probably the only um, sort of member of the public, if you like, from, from my ward to actually make the, the vote in Nandale and Estale. And I wondered, so I see there's going to be an evaluation report to Communities Committee in, in June 2019. Is there a way of, of getting a breakdown of sort of postcodes or locations of, of people who are voting so that we can compare that between the last uh, PB event that happened at the beginning of this year and the PB event that, that will happen um, later this year and the beginning of next, just to make sure that we are um, making sure that, you know, across the whole region that, that democratic deficit is being fixed and, you know, the, the learning process is, is ongoing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important that we understand the whole uh, dynamic of uh, um, voting, um, uh, both for regional and for um, more local projects, and certainly that will be picked up as part of the evaluation. Thanks, yep. Um, David and then Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, participatory uh, budget, I'm quite enthusiastic about it, uh, its potential. Um, my point is concerning the steering groups um, and the transparency. Uh, so I'd like to know what the current thinking is on what uh, should be a steering group and how these uh, individuals are selected to be on it, how would they operate, uh, because they are the guarantors of uh, transparency, probity and, um, aw and, and awareness. Um, I've said in the past that I think that perhaps that would be a role for an area committee because area committees struggle to find a role uh, at the moment and um, we weren't allowed to discuss that at our area committee. I'm not sure we're going to be able to discuss it. We're uh, allowed to discuss it at the next area committee. But um, what is the current thinking on how steering groups should be formed?
Um, well, actually, I will come here. I was going to let Harry speak first, but um, the group that you're so worried about are currently um, winning at least a silver medal um, at the COSLA Excellence Awards this year for participatory budgeting and their, uh, their contribution to the fight against poverty in the Fries and Galloway. The very least they'll get is a silver, it may be gold. Okay? And that was in the council or PNR papers the other day when we agreed for people to go. So uh, just uh, um, a word of caution, I also attend that group meeting. I'm not chair, as a member there. It, the whole thing was driven right from day one by people who, who were in or had lived in or had experienced poverty. Right? Not the whole participatory budgeting exercise here. We're only talking about anti -poverty, the tackling poverty part. Yeah, Every person who's on that committee right, with a vote right, has either been in they experience poverty. That's the criteria. They are the people who know what it's like, not the people looking from the outside and telling them what they need. They, they, they're, they're, they're very quick to tell you, and we've had them here before, right? and the transformation in that group over the year was immense. So I'm, I'm defending them, right? because I sit there and take a back, a back, a back seat, watch what's going on, and it's absolutely fantastic. So and I'm, I'm going out on a limb there when I'm saying that. That is exactly how I feel about it. But I'll let Harry come in with the technical stuff. Thanks, Chair. I'll endeavour to cover the, the technical stuff. Uh, uh, section 322, um, that is certainly what we are recommending in terms of the um, formation of the steering group moving forward. So uh, clearly, Chair, Vice Chair of this committee, the technical support would be provided by the Council's Anti-Poverty Office, and that's certainly to ensure um, where possible that the criteria that's been established, hopefully agreed by members today, that, 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 that the applications can um, demonstrate uh, impact and outcomes associated with that. And as the Chair has outlined, members of the reference group who live uh, have got that lived experience of, of poverty. Because PB is all about empowering, involving uh, um, communities in making choices that impact communities. So I think already we have been contacted by um, other areas who are perhaps earlier on in the, the, the programme of PB to be to ask how we go about it, and certainly, um, uh, as the, the chairs mentioned, the work we've done today has been recognised uh, on a national basis through through COSLA. So, hopefully, that clarifies the situation. It's a quick comment. I'm just worried that there's too much, there'll be too much steering by the steering groups, and I, I appreciate this is about the tackling poverty aspect of it, but I just want to make the general comment that I don't like the selection method. I'd rather it was an election method for um, choosing the steering groups and uh, elected members are elected. And I think that'd be more transparent. Oh, that's my comment. Um, well, actually, the, 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 whole, the whole point of this is that that's the group that take it forward. That's what we're being recognised nationally is, the, is that an exemplary good practice. It's that they're the people, right? It, and it's to stop the interference of councillors, to be quite frank, right? Telling people what they need. Right? They'll tell you what they want. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Andrew, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I, I think it's, it's a good report in all fairness, and I, as you rightly highlight, you know, uh, we're being identified as good practice. The only areas that I really want to try and focus on, and I've already raised it with yourself at the area of committee, and that is we do not lose sight of the issues that cause poverty. There's an awful emphasis at the moment of looking at the effects and trying to address the effects of poverty. But I want to see us actually spend more money on tackling the issues. Um, that's a very well made point, actually. Um, and I think that's something we'll make sure is in the agenda for the reference group when we actually tighten up the recommendations and, and the uh, the rules of how what can apply, what kind of thing you can do. Absolutely, Andrew. Um, Harry, any, you want to add, add to that? Yeah, just briefly, Chair, there will be a report coming to this committee in November of this year that will provide an update on where we are with the Council's uh, anti-poverty strategy and action plan. And absolutely, uh, our focus, where at all possible, is about preventing people from home, falling into home, uh, uh, to, uh, poverty to start with. But unfortunately, um, there's factors out with our direct control, and uh, another focus is to mitigate the impacts. So absolutely, they're not looked at in isolation, they're looked at in tandem. John, did you want to come in? 
I just got to say, like, as I say, uh, 1st October, it's anti-poverty week for a week. Uh, probably that's why it's called anti-poverty week. But, uh, <coughs> but the, the anti-poverty week is on then. So, as I say, it's a chance for every member to get along. There's a lot of events on, so it gives all the members. So I'd like to, as many members as possible to try and get along to some of these events that will be taking place. Um, good. Um, there's some of them as well in... Uh, quite a number of them actually in the rural areas that are a bit harder to get to and there, I know there's some in Newton Stewart for example and some in Langham uh, that are getting put on but that will all come out to you as a, an invitation uh, am I right that's coming through as an invitation uh, through eGender okay um, thanks very much any other questions okay so we'll go to the recommendations okay are we happy to agree the outline criteria for 2018-19 Happy to agree the outline timetable for the delivery of the 2018-19 uh, Target and Poverty PB process. And 2.3, uh, Ian. Just, I wonder, just, I'll just interrupt now, sorry, apologies for interrupting, just as we go through, but I just, you mentioned something earlier, I just want to be build it in as another, if it's an option, I, I, as another recommendation maybe, but it's, it came from, stimulated from the comments you made earlier in regards to, we're leading, uh, partly across Scotland, but certainly Dumfries and Gala when it comes to participating in the budget. And there's other authorities within Dumfries and Gala that need to really catch up. We, If we're leading, should we be taking a lead and actually looking for some kind of report coming back that says, listen, this is how we can best affect, help other, the other authorities, whether it's the police, whether it's NHS, whether it's DGHP as an organisation, to try and encourage them to get to get embedded into this uh, participating in budget and uh, legislation that we now have. Well, I, absolutely. And as you know, you're probably going to Cosla, uh, you'll, you'll be there. So the, out, the results of that will be included in the next report to this committee. And, and obviously, um, the success, and if it's gold in particular, you'll be hearing about it a lot quicker than that. Um, is that what you're getting at, Ian? It's not really. It's about us taking the lead and actually encouraging, taking the, almost like through the community plan and partnership. Maybe maybe it does already exist in that. I'm not on that actual board, but uh, just to say, right, listen, see the rest of these. We sit around the table with partners across Dumfries and Galloway for the best interests of the people in Dumfries and Galloway. This participatory budget, it's legislation. We think it's a good thing. We're leading on it. Let's all buy into it. And how do we actually make that happen? Okay, Derek will take that forward. Okay. Yeah, no, just very briefly. Thank you, Chairman. The point's very well made. And indeed, yes, it will feature on the community planning agenda for that very reason, because it's absolutely critical that uh, all agencies, as the report indicates, who have an obligation uh, fulfil that. And we're working closely with our partners uh, to, to raise the bar on that very issue. So more than happy to maintain uh, progress back uh, to this committee. Thank you. Um, in that case, then, we'll move on to item 10. The welfare reform update. Um, the council is committed to protecting our most vulnerable people and mitigating the worst effects of welfare reform. This report brings members up to speed with the position since full service universal credit was ruled out earlier this year. Again, I've got Lorna here to answer any questions in this. Um, any add, Lorna? No, no chair. Thanks. Nothing to add. Okay. Thank you. Let's go straight to questions. Rob. Thank you, Chairman. Looking at uh, paragraph 3.7 in um, relation to recommendation 2.1, where we're being asked to increase priority level to high priority only. This is with reference to Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, and the paragraph goes on to say, which will mean generally lower awards for applicants. Now, obviously, every application is going to be different. Um, so it may be a fairly difficult question. But in making a decision on that, is it possible to give us an indication of I mean, what sort of how much lower is generally lower, um, roughly? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, you quite rightly say every application is different. Um, the, the reduction of the priority level doesn't tend to mean that less people get. It just it depends on it, specifically around community care grants where someone's making an application for multiple items for the household. It may mean that we can't meet, fulfil all the requirements for, for that household. But that will be dependent on the household as well. So where there's specific needs in the household, then obviously we would continue to meet them where there's a compelling high need um, for that. So it's not an exact science because it will depend on individuals, but it generally means that we don't probably fulfil the full list of requirements for household items. So, you know, things like cookers and washing machines, 
they're regarded as essential items, but we may not be able to meet all the floor coverings, or we may not be able to fully give three sets of chest of drawers if there's a family requirement. So that tends to be the types of things um, that, that's impacted. Thank you, Chairman. I recognise it was a difficult question, but that helps me understand what we're, the, the implications of what we're being asked to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, actually, if we can get um, let this develop until the next committee and bring back some options, um, how we might have to fund them. Maybe let Derek come in. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks, Councillor Davidson. It is, it is a difficult issue, and it is uh, complex, given uh, the, the legislative framework that uh, the officers are dealing with. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you would note from the earlier item on the budget monitoring that uh, we do have uh, 100,000 uh, set aside uh, unallocated in welfare reform. So therefore, uh, to if members wish, and it's entirely, as you've indicated, Chairman, that your uh, discretion whether or not at this point you wish to hold off making that decision pending uh, the consideration of those uh, monies being applied. So that's certainly something that's within your gift today. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Derek. Um, Adam? Certainly, I would welcome some sort of report coming back. I don't think any of us want to um, be in a position where a lack of resources is, um, you know, in, in one allocated budget is stopping us from, from actually giving the care and, and support that's needed to, to vulnerable people. Um, so, but I was wanting to come in. Another point is just I, I see in Table 1, um, it's a number... Uh, sort of breakdown of universal credit claimants and just out of interest and, and to help me understand if there's a universal credit claimant who is on a zero hours contract would they be put into a conditionality group where they had a requirement uh, for preparing for work a plan for work or, or such like or would there be no work requirements thanks chair um they could be in in Yes, and a, and a preparing, looking for work, because if they're in a zero hours and there's a requirement to work more hours to bring them up, yes, they will be in that. My understanding from Job Centre, there is assurances that there is a cognizance of what zero hours means, and you know some people are just waiting and what they're being told from week to week um, to work. But Job Centre will be monitoring that and asking for people to consider how they increase their hours or get more certainty around about that. It is quite a difficult one, but... <laughs> Um, there is that recognition on it. Okay, happy with that. Anyone else? Ian? Thanks, Chair. I wouldn't mind just, just so I can fully understand this, Lorna. Just what I'm, so, it talks about 3.7 in, in the recommendations, it refers to that. So, it's agreed to uh, increase to the priority level to high, which is a way of actually reducing the success rate, I think, of applicants. I think that's what kind of, maybe it's no, maybe it's no, just increasing the the criteria, it seems like that. And it was, in a, I suppose, when I was looking through it, we look at the 18 19 numbers. I'm taking that up to date. So it's, and I'm taking the first quarter. Is it maybe, is, is it beyond that? And even just looking at the crisis grants, which is on page 243, but I think it applies right through as an example. It shows that 18 19 up to now, maybe we're six months in, but when you look at the, the level of spend to what we've got, depending on if it's, is it a quarter, is it six months in, what is it? I'm just not sure. It looks like we're going to go horrifically beyond what the budget what we've got. So it just it's reassurance that am I reading this in the right way? Is that correct? Because if it isn't, if that's the case, what's what have we got any uh, I suppose trajectory line of what the overspend would have been? Thanks, Chair. The eighteen nineteen figures are as at the twenty second of August. Um so we're um, nearly halfway through the through the year. We're looking at it and we know there's always a slight increase and demand for crisis and community care grant over the winter period, obviously, because fuel price, you know, the request for assistance with fuel goes up. So based on last year's um, level of spend over the month, we're looking at this point in time, if we continued on the, the route of travel that we're going, we think there'll be an overspend, and that's why we're saying can we increase it to high? Obviously, um, as the chair and Derek's um, alluded to, that there's potential for extra funds in there should you know, members so choose. Um, increasing the, the priority to high doesn't actually mean that less people will get an award. What it actually means is they'll get less of an award. So we won't give them as much, but the same number of people um, are likely to be assisted. But obviously, universal credit is continuing to roll out, and we're already seeing that the demand and the, the level of awards we give to people in universal credit 
is about 25 per cent higher than those who are not in universal credit. So we're taking you know, that into account as well as we're trying to track the impact. We will, we'll be coming back to committee in November and there will be a further update report. So we'll, you know, we'll have more figures and be able to uh, make an assessment um, at that time as well. Thank, thanks, Chairman. Um, Mr. Crichton has been very, very helpful indeed. Um, I would suggest, um, I, I guess, in line with Councillor Wilson, that we um, don't then decide at 2.1 to increase the priority level today, recognising that there's £114,000 that was uh, uh, outlined in the appendix to the Revenue Budget Monitoring Report, which has not been required for the welfare reform purposes it was set aside for. Um, and we therefore get a report back. It's coming anyway um, in November. Um, it will allow us to assess whether um, it would be appropriate for us to use that 114,000, um, or whether it would be sufficient. Indeed, but let's let's get the numbers back as is being suggested, um, <coughs> and that report would allow us to make a decision. Uh, we, we couldn't possibly do that today because it's two different reports and it's only just been mentioned. But that would allow us to make a decision uh, at that point about whether we can apply that money and keep the priority levels as they are, or whether even with applying that money we might have to make a change. Uh, I think that may be a good way forward. I think that's very fair. Um, Adam? I completely agree um, with Rob on that, and I think that I would very much welcome a report in November. Just some quick governance advice. I believe that at Policy Resources on Tuesday that it was there in one of the reports it was updated that, that in um, particular, fund policy development fund on welfare reform. It was reported that um, it was not going to be used, and I was just wondering: would we also require a report to policy and resources? And if that is the case, can we make sure that any reports to policy and resources um, that are needed to to give that happen before the next committee, um, so that when we sit here in November, if we decide that we need to use that funds, um, you know, to alleviate the pressures detailed here, that that we can do so at that committee. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can say there would only be a decision required at policy and resources if there was funding required that was out with the community's budget. Okay, so we we can err on the side of caution here today, but have it available um, at the director's discretion um, should there be an avalanche between now and then. Um, is, that, is that what you're saying? Uh, Ian? I think Councillor Davidson puts a, a good proposal forward. I think it's leave the status quo. Don't agree with the recommendation of 2.1, but we've got that, that surplus potentially set and we've got a report come back in November. I think that's appropriate time. We'll have more hard facts, more evidence, actually collateral evidence to make a, a more informed decision at that point. I think that's the right way forward, Chairman. Um, well, if you're moving that, uh, I, I, you can do so, but I'm, I, I'd be mind to actually move the recommendations because there was a hell of a long time between now if it goes to committee in November to then put into place after that if people are needing the money. So, um. I wonder if you just, Chairman, just to, just to make clear what I meant was that I think on the back of it, the, information, the question that I asked Lorna said, listen, that actually, you, this doesn't it mean there'll be folk getting less, the less people are qualified for this, but the chances that they'll get less money. So I think in regards to that impact, we have a pocket of money that may well just keep it the same high, medium to high, rather than just go to high. So therefore, it applies the same as it is. I didn't know what I get political about this whatsoever. I think it's one of the regards to having the safeguards in place that we don't go over budget. I don't think we will, but just keep it the status quo in regards to what seems to have been an effective policy. So what, why take that risk at this moment in time? We don't actually know what's going to happen, but in November, we'll actually have that hard, those hard facts, that information there that says yes. And it was your leader that actually proposed that, not me. Well, I, I think we're at cross purposes here. Rob, can you do you want to back in? No, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that we, we would not wish to increase the priority level for Scottish Welf Welfare Fund uh, to, today. And I, I mean, I think uh, actually everyone is saying the same thing. They're saying the same um, thing. Because that would clearly have a, a potentially negative consequence for applicants. And given that we know that there's this 114,000 or thereby, which could be applied to it if we decide in November. We should get the report in November, see where we got to at that point, and, and act accordingly, I guess. Um, I'm that's what I thought, Ian, and I couldn't understand where you're coming from there. So, so are you happy with that? And so you don't need to make an amendment. You're happy to go with that? Yep. Okay, so we'll go. We'll, um, we'll come into the recommendations just two seconds, and uh, we'll go with the status quo until November. 
Um, am I right? Yep. Um, so we're asked to one agree that high priority or we're, we're not. We're actually um, we are going to delay that decision and to monitor and bring back a report in November. And to note the progress in relation to the carers allowance supplement. Um, okay, are you happy with that? Okay, agreed. Thank you very much. Um, good. Let's move on to uh, item 11, enhancing and refocusing our corporate and community winter resilience arrangements. Report by Head of Service again. Um, and Okay, the re report advises members of our proposals to enhance our winter resilience and arrangements and to highlight the continued emphasis being provided to support community resilience. Um, uh, Martin, I know, uh, um, we've got Martin Ogilvy will be here to, um, to uh, ask if there are any questions in the report. I, I'm assuming everybody got a copy of that through them. That was in the extra papers that came out. And, uh, Nice, plenty of nice pictures. Um, so, are we ready to move to any questions? Yep. Is there anything else to add? No. Fine. Thank you. Um, okay. No questions? In that case, then I'm just going to move straight to recommend D. Sorry, Rob? In, in, in the absence of any questions, I, I wanted to welcome the report. I mean, I do think it's a, a, it's a very sensible way forward and it builds on the good work that we've already been doing with a lot of communities across the region. We've got a kind of name for ourselves, I guess, nationally as being good at doing resilience with communities rather than to them. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to welcome it as, a, a, I guess, a natural extension and development of the, the progress we've made over the past 10 years that, that I've been around at any rate. Um, you know, appreciate the, the, the effort that officers have put in but particularly appreciate the commitment that communities have, you know, all composed of volunteers um, turning out in the worst of weathers to help their neighbours. Um, actually, you read my mind, Rob, I was going to say that at the end. Um, uh, Martin, thank you very much, and can you thank all the volunteers out there and people um, from the committee? I think that's a sensible way and proper way to go forward. So if you can do that next time you meet with them, that would be much obliged. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's it. So we'll, we'll just go with the recommendations. Are we happy? Uh, 2.1, to note. 2.2, right, agree, new comprehensive approach. 2.3, note the contribution. 2.4, note the potential of a modest spent save investment. And then 2.5, agree to introduce a tiered community resilience recognition scheme that formally acknowledges community groups that commit to improving their resilience locally. Okay, and that's the bit I was asking you to go back to them and say thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Okay, we're, um, we're on to item 12, uh, the annual community safety survey, results in next steps. Again, it's you, Martin, isn't it? Um, so I'm sure members will have noted we have uh, two 2.2 recommendations, so the recommendation should be 2.1 to 2.5. Um, uh, we typo. Um, the purpose of this report is to enable members to consider the results of the annual community safety survey. Again, um, we've got Martin Ogilvie here to answer any questions on this report. Martin, any, anything you add, Martin? Um, any questions? Jim? Uh, and maybe an observation again, maybe there's a question, Chair, but on page 269, uh, the one to fourth bullet point, no, the third bullet point, the bottom of the paragraph, where it talks about 13% of respondents in northwestern freeze mid and upper Nistel and Dale South feel either unsafe or very unsafe when out and about in their neighbourhood. There has been a huge upturn in uh, 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 antisocial behaviour and, and, and criminal damage recently up in my ward. And I'm just hoping that this is Martin underlining that he'll be committing staff there to support the community and support the police and the job they do. Uh, there's no doubt your community safety team do a good job, but if they're no, if they're no in place, the, the canny, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them in the places where they're most needed most frequently, and that appears to be these three locations at present. Okay, I'll let Martin in a minute, but uh, this survey has been used to help the realignment of, of, of the service to at the areas that are most needed. Okay, but I think that's a summary, Martin, you might want to add something. It's maybe alluded to in the report, but what we have done uh, over the last four months is done far more joint working with the police, particularly to try and disrupt 
antisocial behaviour before it starts to get to the unrowdy stage. So I uh, had a very successful campaign of doing joint patrols with the police during the summer holidays. Uh, the formal debrief of that will take place next week, but we, we already, I think, know that we'd like to repeat it in the, the school October holidays during the, the build-up to bonfire night over Christmas and New Year and other school holidays. So they'll see uh, a joint presence of a community safety officer on, out on a paired patrol with a police officer. And we will very much be using the evidence that we gather from the, the multi-agency task and coordination groups, the other discussions that we have through the antisocial behaviour groups that we have, so that, yes, we absolutely will be targeting the areas where we know there's a known problem. Thanks, Martin. Jim, you want back in? Just an observation again, Chair. I, I, I remember speaking to Martin and uh, other members of staff, and, and unfortunately, most of the time, they have to walk about in bright yellow jackets, and they might as well have a beacon in their hands as well, because the kids see them and run away. I mean, I would hope that some of the patrols will be in civilian I think that was one of the suggestions in the past to try and identify these kids and get a more realistic uh, picture of what's happening because there's nothing sure. When I, I mean, I live in the high streets, so I can see the kids running away when the, and mobile phones now don't help. So sometimes you have to be a uh, somewhat devious in your approach to just identify where the issues are. I absolutely. I think the first thing is always, of course, is to prevent and then detect if the prevention doesn't work. But uh, so it's an argument that's been going on for uh, 200 years, Jim. But no doubt Martin's got a view on that. No, thanks, Chair. Absolutely. We, we do try to get a blend, and increasingly we're doing more uh, patrols in civilian clothing. Uh, we carry the, uh, the CCTV camera to capture the evidence. So if we activate the camera, we still have to off, you know, issue the warning that the cameras are active. But more and more, there, there is plainclothes patrolling taking place. And the member might also be aware that back in January last year, we brought a report to the committee to say that we were rebranding the team. We've taken them out of their black fatigues and their yellow high-vis jackets. We've now got them in a blue patrol uniform, which is more discreet. It doesn't quite, you know, obviously as visible as the high the high-vis jackets, but it does have that authority around the uniform, which is important when you're trying to reassure people and act as that deterrence. So it's just trying to get that balance right between deterrence and detection. Sorry, I'll move straight to recommendations then. Um, are we 2.1 happy to note and acknowledge the public response to the survey? I think we can actually maybe go further than that and actually thank the, the public and uh, um, rather than just note and acknowledge. 2.2, um, agree the results of the community safety survey and it will, and it will be used to influence the community safety patrolling priorities during the year ahead. 2.2. Three, that should be then, is agree that, that results and feedback will be made available online and at customer service centres during September 2018. Okay, two, that shall now be the 2.4, right? Agree that engagement on the survey results will be ongoing with organisations representing those with protected characteristics. Right? And finally, note the next steps in paragraph 3.10, in particular the plan to improve and better target patrol routes to monitor income closely and better engage with community and, and councils. Um, and in that, of course, we can take as read, that will include both uniform and um, covert uh, surveillance. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks, uh, Martin. Okay, we're on the item 13, which is uh, support for the Scottish Rural Parliament uh, on the 14th, 16th November in Srinrar. Um, the Council works hard to ensure the challenges facing rural areas are given national prominence. I'm therefore delighted that the Scottish Rural Parliament is coming to Srinrar later this year. The report asks members to agree the Priest and Galloway Council support for the Scottish Rural Parliament to be held 14th 16th November in Srinrar. Jamie Ferguson is here. will take any questions on the report. Rob? Uh, not a question so much as to say I'm delighted that the Rural Parliament is coming to Stranraer. It's um, a high time it came to Dumfries and Galloway anyway. Um, and I think that the, the allocation of the £8,000, which was fortuitously unallocated in the budget, um, is a sensible thing to do, uh, given it's a major event, um, uh, one of national significance. Uh, thanks very much. Nice comments. Hey, Adam? 
Thanks, Chair. Myself and, and Councillor Dempster are just admiring the fact of going to the crafty distillery, and we wouldn't quite mind going ourselves. Um, but as a, just a, a sort of <laughs> some indication of, you know, obviously there's a couple of local businesses uh, going to be getting support. Is there sort of an indication of how much sort of, um, you know, what consequence for the for the economy it will be and the, the level of support that will be received and sort of the impact having the rural parliament here will, will have on, the, on particularly the west of the region? Um, just before you come in, Jamie, I, um, take your point about other members going, it's bad for you, the distillery, just so that you're aware, right? And it's no, it's no major event, so you're not getting a special invite. Um, Jamie, sorry, I'm not wanting to, uh, to take away from this because this is a huge achievement for the region. It's only the third one in Scotland, I think. Open invitation to all members to events. <laughs> Well, the, that, well, that included taxi. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't want to hey, disappoint I'm, 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 I'm worried about the departmental budget of Ronnie's to get a taxi all the way home to Langham, right? I think there's still work going on speculatively on what the impacts will be <coughs> and to try to maximise those impacts. But I think the precedence for the past two events that there have been some pretty good impacts on local economies. That's really all I could add to it. Um, on a more serious note, rather than having 43 members going down the A75 or claiming 45 pence a mile, um, are we, is the potential there to get a minibus or something so that if, a, if there's two or three want to go, they can do that? Yeah, okay. So we can leave that within the, man the management of the, the event. Thanks very much. Okay, in that case then, any more questions? Um, uh, well, A, straight away, it's a, it's a huge feather in our cap. That's the first thing I have to say. I agree with Rob on that. So we move the recommendations. Are we noting the Scottish Parliament will be, uh, rural Parliament will be in Sunrar on the 14th, 16th of November? It's noted. And then agree the council support for the event. Right. Happy to note and then agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie. Um, item 14, of course, is no longer on the agenda. So we'll go to item 15. Um, a cultural strategy for Scotland response to the consultation by Scottish Government. Um, the report sees members' agreement to a response to the, the consultation on its draft culture strategy, for, the Government's draft culture strategy for Scotland. We've got Harry and Ian Barr here who can answer any questions. Uh, any had, Harry? Uh, just very briefly, Chair. Um, just to, to emphasise that at 3. Point, as it says at 3.6, this is the Council's draft response uh, to the, the Scottish Government's consultation uh, and uh, as outlined at 3.6 we've encouraged the, the regional cultural sector to provide responses separately to ensure that there is a, a variety of uh, responses from Dumfries and Galloway uh, and uh, the Stove and, and DGU have been working on holding public engagement events uh, in Kirkcubri on Tuesday of this week and there's one uh, in, in the Stove tonight uh, to, to uh, get uh, public engagement uh, and enable them to respond fully with uh, the, the public view and, and the sector's view as well. Um, the, the primary issues covered in the proposed council draft response are detailed at 3.7 in the report, but happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Any questions? Okay, in that case, we'll go straight to the recommendations. Are we happy to note and consider uh, 2.1 and then agree 2.2? Right, thank you very much. Let's uh, move on to item 16, which is, of course, the follow-on from that, which is the development of a cultural strategy for the Peace and Galloway. Um, and again, the report presents members with the progress regarding the development of a cultural strategy for the Peace and Galloway um, and an opportunity to discuss the policy intent and the objectives of the strategy. Again, I've got Harry and Ian here. Happy to... Uh, any add, Harry? No, no. So happy to answer, answer any questions. Are we quite happy? In that case, I'll move on to the recommendations. Are we uh, happy to note the background in progress? I agree the project plan, uh, which is, of course, is the final strategy submitted um, for approval by December 2019, so plenty of time. And then 2.3, consider and comment on the policy intent, which will provide the foundation of the strategy objectives and the emerging areas. So, given, given that we're happy to just to uh, uh, let that go, leave it in officer hands and we'll get a report back. Um, when would, would we be looking for some sort of update, maybe six months in or something, Derek? Yeah. 
Same okay, so, and maybe we put a two point four in there to commit to receive an update in six months. Okay, mid mid term. Yeah. So can we do that? Uh, right, chair, yeah? it's very much part of the uh, business plan monitoring as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, all right, we'll move on to the Kukubri Art Gallery project, uh, item 17. Okay, we all know the best things in life come to those who wait. <laughs> um, I didn't narrate this, by the way. Because um, <laughs> I'm still waiting for the best things in life. Um, right, our council has supported the establishment of a national gallery in Kukubri for a long number of years, and let's all celebrate and agree it has been worth the wait. The report updates members on the completion. Harry and Ian again are here um, to answer any questions. Um, have you any to add, Harry? Uh, nothing to add, Chair. As outlined in the report, we had proposed to bring a report to Policy and Resources Committee in November to go into more detail uh, on the, the background to the uh, overspender. Okay, thanks. Just like to add, I know it says there in 3.9 about the overspend, but one of the local papers highlighted the day, no congratulating the gallery, but hinting it's got to be an excess spend. Having, when you read the report for the sneak preview, we had on the 8th of June to 12th of July, 12,000 visitors would visit that gallery. I know in tight budget terms, but I think an overspend of 247 is, can be accepted when you see the outcome of the Kirkby Gallery. Um, my view entirely, and I, um, I raised that with the comms team who raised it with the BBC to take out a, what's uh, arguably the most secure, best new facility uh, in Scotland and pick out that it's uh, 247k or something like that uh, overspent. Um, uh, wasn't it helpful? Um, I'm still waiting for a response to that. Um, but I'm not holding my breath waiting for the response. Um, uh, uh, just like you, I've actually done some sums as well because I'm averaging out here at 9k a month. 9,000 people have gone through per month since this uh, this kicked off. Um, for me, it's a huge positive. It's a huge uh, feather in our cap. And uh, I've actually asked Harry um, outside here that when we do the report for PNR and everyone else that we highlight exactly where the, the overspends were. And where some of the overspends we know, for example, were to increase the security, to increase the ambience in the building, that were, um, which have allowed us to attract um, real th things of national significance. And I don't want to stray into the, the, the bit later on, but I think um, the people of Kikubri actually need congratulating this because it's, it's, a, it's a whole town project, not just the council. Rob, you want in? Thanks, Chairman. Two very brief observations. Um, the 9,000 a week figure, the average 9,000 week, uh, a week figure, I think from memory, albeit it's an imperfect aid, would probably compare very well with the figures that were achieved in the Monet exhibition of a, a number of years ago, um, which was itself the summer exhibition that had the highest ever number of either weekly or um, uh, totally uh, in total aggregated attendances. To me, that represents a very good start. Um, the second thing that I guess is worth re remembering people, because it stuck out to me at the time, was Professor Cole's response to my question at full council when we discussed the DG1 report. And I'm very cautious about mentioning DG1 in the same sentence as a Kirkubri Art Gallery, because they are by no means similar in any way, shape or form. But his response in terms of managing costs struck me as being very interesting. Um, uh, and it was, if I remember rightly, that um, the people who use the building and will benefit from it in the future will remember its quality, not the financial outturn. And the quality of the building speaks for itself. I suspect it's quite difficult for people in the public sector to get away with that attitude uh, all that often, um, but I certainly intend to give it a good try because it's been an excellent project. The quality of it speaks for itself. And you know, if that's John Cole's view, I'll happily sign up to it. Absolutely, and uh, the feed the food and moving on as well from going to that to other things in the town. Uh, my family is a perfect example. We went down there to see the solar collection um, and then ended up seeing dinosaurs and God knows what and, uh, across the road. So it's uh, people spend a day and uh, John and I have both visited on a number of occasions now um, support for the staff and I've, I've hardly heard a, a negative comment. Um, a fantastic facility. 
Does anybody get any, any other questions? No. In that case, then, um, we'll move uh, swiftly on to the recommendations, and that's note the successful completion of the Kubri Art Gallery project, and that the Council's project completion requirements include handover of essential certification have been met by the project contractors and architects. And 2.2, that a report on the project outturn position will be provided at the next meeting of the Posting Resources Committee covering the areas reflected in the paragraphs 3.9 to 3.11. And that, of course, that detailed thing will then tell us what the overspends were about, yeah. Um, which is, I think, once that comes out, it will make certain stories look quite silly, right? Um, and I think, I'm, I'm, I'm on the hoof here, but I think we should put a 2.3 in there again, as in the committee should record its thanks to all the volunteers and the people who help uh, in the Kukubri, wider Kukubri and Stuart area who made this uh, possible. So can we arrange to do that, yeah? Can I do that on behalf of the committee? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, you'll John and I will both sign that. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll move on to item 18. Uh, the introduction of the Regional Events Growth Fund. Members are asked to approve the eligibility criteria of the Regional Events Growth Fund, which is being introduced to enable smaller scale festivals and events to grow with support from the Council's major festivals and strategies, uh, and event strategy 2018-2021. Uh, um, uh, again, I've got Harry and Ian here to answer any questions. Um, I, I think the comment I would make is it's a relatively small amount of money, but it, it's the importance of the support that goes along with that is the, for me, would be the, the crux of the matter. So it, it would give fledgling organisations who've been trying hard to expand the, the opportunity to do and support to do that. So, okay, so um, have you any add to that, Harry? None to add to Okay, thanks. We are going, uh, Adam. Thanks, I, I just think to, to fully welcome the report, obviously, you know, uh, earlier this year the committee agreed a very um, ambitious target on around our major festival event strategy. And, you know, although we have seven fantastic signature events uh, in the region just about every year. And I think it's really important to recognise those small events that are, you know, really up and coming uh, and deserve our support as well. So I think a really good report and fully welcome it. Thanks, Adam. Anybody else? Ian? Thanks. Just in regards to 2.2, .2, what we're agreeing, I think the 2 to 4 uh, organisations potential there, what, what, any, any expressions of interest, I should say, what does that look like, do you think, just as we go forward? Again, we've got 15k, it's not a big, big budget by any means, but it's certainly very helpful. It will be a pump prime to some organisations. Did you get an indication of some kind of size or, or potential of the organisations that may well be expressing interest? Um, I, I think, I, I, I take your point, Ian, because it's how long is the piece of string? We, we don't know because we don't know what's got to come forward. There might be one or two there, and I think the suggestion was any councillor who's got a reasonable suggestion get in touch with Ian or Harry and discuss it with them and see if that would meet the criteria and, and take it forward. So I think that's what you're getting at, isn't it? Because somebody may come up with... I, I totally get your point here, because if it's something brand new, um, it doesn't meet the criteria here. Um, I, I suppose we had a similar similar system going on in the past, maybe with a different name, but it just, it was, I thought it maybe had been some expressive interest. If there's no, then my question just falls, Chairman, but no, I certainly would be quite willing to put stuff forward if if that's put to me. It was mere if we had actually had any expressive interest. If not, it's kind of finger in the air for next year. Well, I, I think I'd be a bit wary of identifying any organisations at this time, because um, I think that would kind of smack of prior knowledge. Um, and I think uh, in terms of governance and clarity for the, the public out there, they should all be told at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, Harry? Uh, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we're we facilitating uh, some workshops across the region to uh, um, to publicise um, the, the, the growth fund uh, and to enable organisations locally to come along and learn about what's being proposed. Um, the fund, uh, we proposed to open the fund to applications on the 17th September uh, for a period of about five weeks. And happy to discuss, uh, you know, I think Ian, uh, principally, you know, or myself would be happy to discuss any uh, applications with uh, organisations themselves or uh, uh, people acting uh, on their behalf at um, at the point where the um, the fund is open. 
but certainly the, the key thing we'd encourage uh, organisations to do is to attend the workshops that are being facilitated over the next couple of weeks. That help, Ian? Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? No? In that case, we'll go straight to the recommendations. Um, 2.1, note the highlights of the issues. Oh, sorry, I'm on the street scene. Um, we're in front of myself, folks. Sorry about that. 2.1, approve the eligibility criteria of the Regional Events Growth Fund. Paragraphs 3.8, which forms part of the delivery of the major festival and event strategy. And 2.2, .2, note that the recommended regional growth events will be the subject of a major events, festivals and event strategy report to the Communities Committee in the first quarter of 2019. Okay, are we comfortable with that? Thank you very much. Um, item 19 is the street scene community conversations. As part of this year's budget, we agreed to introduce community conversations. This has been an innovative approach, and I'm really pleased with the evaluation of the work. The report advises members of the feedback from the street scene community conversations, which took place in June of 2018. Again, I've got Harry and Jamie here uh, with, with Jamie this time to answer any questions. Um, Harry, have you anything to add at this stage? Uh, nothing to add to the report at this stage, but as you say, okay, I have a big I'm, I'm open to questions. Oh, hello, Mr. Justy. Hi. Hi. I just was looking for you in there. Okay. Um, uh, right. Any questions? So we have to go with the recommendation. Rob, sorry. It, very briefly. I can't even speak. It must be getting near lunchtime. Um, just very briefly to welcome um, the way that this has been rolled out. And I think we, we ought to congratulate the staff who actually led the street scene events themselves. Um, I do think that's important because it's not the stuff that we have ordinarily asked them to do at all. Um, but, you know, all the accounts that I've had of it have been that they have really done a fantastic job um, in, you know, going and, 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 and speaking to a, a, a whole full of people. Um, when that's not part of the day job. Um, I mean, frankly, I still don't like doing that, and I've been doing it for 10 years. So we were asking a lot of the staff in that, uh, in that regard, and I think we ought to just, you know, re record the fact that we appreciate that not only did they do it, they did it well, and it went down well with the public. Okay, the, the flurry activity here is I'm seeking governance advice of the soups here. Um, <laughs> that's very important, important in my intervention, um, Chairman. I, 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 now, we'll, we'll carry on with this just now. Um, the, the soup will be okay for a wee while. Um, uh, Jim, and then... Just to echo what Rob said, our staff did a tremendous job, and it was a good exercise, a good exercise for members to attend as well. The only thing is we've raised the aspirations of the communities. Some of them have set out what they hope we will do, and I genuinely hope we support them as much as we can in achieving the changes that they look for. Some of them quite simple and quite modest, but make a difference to them, especially if they believe or feel that what they've, what they've put in our a, a lap, so to speak, is actually dealt with. Uh, I, absolutely, Jim. Couldn't agree more with you. And I, I think the, the proof of the pudding will be eaten here because uh, to build the community confidence to come forward and participate even more in this will grow if they see that their views have been taken into consideration when we're taking things forward. And I think uh, you're absolutely right in that. And it's, it's a bit worrying in some areas when you've got hard to reach people and you get four or five people turning up, you know. In other areas, you get 20, 30, 60, 70. It's uh, one thing that was earlier, an uh, award event, you know. So it's kind of patchy across the region, and I think one of the big challenges is making sure that we, we reach out to everybody and get them to attend, as many folk as we can. Not just the usual suspects. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So... Um, have we um, got any more questions? No, just got the recommendations in. Uh, 2.1, we're happy to note. 2.2, consider the draft evaluation report. Right. 2.3, agree to the annual street scene community conversations. Right. Uh, we'll not need it as a recommendation, but I think we just thank all the staff involved in that because the, the, um, the work put into it was fantastic. So again, through you, Derek, can you uh, forward that to them? Right, now, um, we've got oh, capital investment strategy. Um, uh, are you want to you, you, you want to continue now and have lukewarm soup? Um, I, I did insist we didn't have a uh, hunt the lentils in the lentil soup today, um, like we had the other day. Um, what are, uh, so I'm in your hands here. I'm happy to continue. 
um, and take the plaque for the soup being called. Right? Right, and then uh, we just horse on because we're pretty close to the end, you know. Hmm? Okay, we'll just continue then, all right? Seems to be. So we'll go to item 20, which is the inclusive play projects. Um, we all recognise how important the inclusive play facilities are for communities, and I was uh, delighted to attend the opening of the inclusive play park at Stair Park in Sonra. That was an absolutely fantastic achievement by the local people there, by the way, because they were the drivers of that. Um, and I think that underpins this whole process. Um, the report asked members to agree the consultation mandate, which will use to seek the views and opinions of our communities in relation to the future locations of investment in a play park within Newton Stewart, Castle Douglas, Upper Nisdale, and Lockerbie. Okay, I've got uh, Harry here. And, uh, uh, Karen, I know I was, um, and Karen to ask, answer any questions. So, have you any you want to add at this stage, Harry? Uh, yes, Chair. Just just to clarify, 3.7, uh, we make reference to no groups having yet been formally identified to lead from a community perspective. Um, that's a very important uh, a step to take. Uh, we're aware that uh, groups exist uh, with some interest in such developments. Uh, for instance, the Lockerbie Trust uh, ha has done a fair bit of work in terms of looking at the potential for an inclusive uh, play park in the town. Uh, and part of the role of the consultation is to really to formally identify those and ensure that the, the community as a whole uh, accepts that those those groups would be potentially the, the, the lead for the community. So that, that's why we're, we're saying they're not being formally identified, although we are aware they're there. Um, okay, so nothing, nothing further to add here. Okay, this was a race to get your hand up first. Um, I've got Jim, Ian and then Adam. Okay, Jim first, then Ian, then Adam, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's about the process in 3.7, and the report says quite clearly the very extent to which groups have been involved in initial discussions. The previous paper talks about how important community councils are, and I attend both Sank and Community Council, neither of them have been approached to date in relation to this project. I actually encourage them to write, and I think they've written without getting a response. I phoned the senior manager in May and asked when the conversation was taking place. I was assured it would take place in June. This is September. As a local member, I've heard nothing at all from any officer in respect of this particular project, despite being quite enthusiastic about it. I, and I'm quite disappointed. I'm glad it's moving forward. I'm glad there seems to be moves. But certainly, I'm not being kept abreast of what the moves are. I, and that worries me because I don't know who my other colleagues are. Eh, but... Eh, I would have thought that we would have been closely involved. And I don't miss community councils. I've no, they've not been contacted formally to date, either Sankar or Kirkconnell. Okay, um, just before you come in, Karen, or, or Harry, this is the first start of the process that actually puts that, this the procedure, the process into place. So th th this is the f very first step. This is the authorization for officers to go ahead and implement what the... Um, that, no, no, that, that is the case, right? So, Harry, have you any specific things, or do you want to speak to Jim offline about what's happening up in up in Nistel? Um, I'll certainly speak to the member off, offline, Chair. Um, as, as you say, this is the, the um, uh, us asking members to, to approve the mandate for the consultation. The consultation will, will start uh, effectively tomorrow. Um, with uh, with meetings being lined up locally in each of the four areas to to bring in um, all concerned uh, groups, including the community councils, but also uh, any other volunteer groups uh, that uh, are active in the areas. I think it was agreed through the budget process, but maybe first time meeting the committee chairman. But I think it's been ample opportunity for people to come forward. My understanding is that this is for council-owned property only. I suppose that's the if I can get that clarification first, it is. I'm getting an order in the head, and just just a point, uh, Chairman. I think it's uh, it excludes a lot of opportunity for other areas. For instance, I can talk about East Riggs uh, being a wee bit parochial, but we are looking at bringing forward potential two million pound project on that field, but we can't tap into this at all. And it's a six hec a six acre site, open space. It's the only place in East Riggs. It is. I mean, if the administration would look to maybe open that up to wider community. Uh, Open space areas, even just open space areas, identified within the 
within the local development plan would be a good starting point, but it's exclusive for council areas, so it's very exclusive, certainly from my perspective, Chairman. Um, it's a council decision, Ian, um, down through the budget setting process, so we we are where we are with it for this, for this programme, right? Obviously, we would be hoping, as this went forward year and year further on, that we'd be looking at things. No, no. I, 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 I suppose the point is, Chair, we, we've got a trust in, in East Riggs, then we actually run it, and we jump at the chance that we're struggling to get voluntary organisations to take this up. As an organisation, as a non-council-owned area, we could make it actually make this work in, in East Riggs. But um, as I'm you, saying, the council decision, I agree with that, and that's why I was polite with my word when I said if the ministry okay, could look I, at this and open it up. I don't know why I get confrontational here, but was it in your budget? I don't think it was. So if it's a budget decision you made. We'll move it forward. We'll take on board what you say, right? Because there's other areas right, who, who could welcome having an inclusive play park. And just absolutely, <coughs> so we're absolutely certain here. This is the inclusive play park part. It's not the ordinary play parks. Yeah. This is the ones where we're actually making um, fantastic changes to the way children with disabilities and, and that are able to access playing outside. All right, so as long as we're clear about that. But, Harry, yeah, and, and you want to add to that? Um, nothing to add to you. Um, clearly, we're, we're acting on the, the uh, decision that was implemented through the budget. Yeah, thanks. Um, Adam? Thanks, Chair. Uh, of course, uh, Welcome your comments on Strangara. I had a chance to, to actually look at the play park yesterday. Absolutely fantastic. I'm sure that and um, that will be enjoyed by kids in, in Strangara for, for many years to come. Uh, there's a, a slight, you know, and fully welcome the report. That there is a slight concern I have, though, and that is that uh, I, when I have asked officers about uh, the sort of work that's taken place in Lockerbie, uh, they have been quite clear and said to me that there is some um, some work has, has taken place, but that isn't reflected in this report. Um, and, and I'm not entirely sure why then that it isn't reflected in the report. I know that Harry's mentioned sort of the Lockerbie Trust, but the Lockerbie Trust has nothing to do um, with those discussions. Uh, I chair the Lockerbie Trust. I wouldn't want any suggestions that um, as chair the Lockerbie Trust, I was, you know, trying to, to sort of determine. And the group that, um, you know, the community assets manager and Andrew Nestle has been discussing with isn't reflected anywhere in this report, and I'm just not entirely sure why. Um, I fully agree that, yep, uh, no group has been formally identified to take a lead uh, at Lockerbie, but just I'm not entirely sure why there's work taking place in the ward, there's conversations that have been had, um, there has some consultation already started with community groups who have shown an interest in Lockerbie, um, and I'm not entirely sure why there's work taking place on the ground that's not been reported to committee, um, particularly when I've tried to raise that um, time and time again. I'd just like some clarification on that. Um, I, I think there's there's a distinction between the formal process here, which is going out to wider community engagement and consultation, uh, and uh, some discussions that have been had uh, following on from the council decision in February. And clearly, people are aware uh, that there was an allocation uh, to each of the four areas uh, uh, covered with a, this round of investment. Um, but there's been no um, no formal moves and, and no uh, wider engagement with the community, other than some discussions that have been had with interested groups. So this, this is the, the formal engagement going out to communities and bring in as many people that are interested as possible to bring their views to bear uh, in terms of what their interests are. Uh, I, I, absolutely. I, I kind of despair at times here. This is a good news story and actually it's turning into a, a festival that's have a moon, right? And I, I totally get the point and where, where exactly does this all fit into the bigger bigger processes? And this, this is very similar to another thing that was happening um, with, with grants in that, you know, where the, the, the boundaries were getting blurred between the normal maintenance of play parks and this very, very specific money for a very, very specific thing for a very, very specific group of people. You know, um, I, I kind of despair, but... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Harry. Um, Chair, maybe it would be helpful to go back to the, the programme which started last year where there were already two groups in existence. In fact, there were three groups in existence in each of the three towns. So Wigton Family Support Group, Parental Inclusion Network and, and the group in Annan had already been formed at the time where the money was allocated uh, to uh, those towns. But in order to ensure that we had the, the, um, 
the widest possible community engagement and consultation, we didn't assume that we were working with those groups at that point in time. We went out to the engagement to ensure that anyone else who had an interest had a chance to have their input into the project. Derek, you win. Uh, just for the record, I think it's important that I say this. The Council took a decision. Officers are implementing it. We are proud to be implementing the decision. There has been no consultation by Council officers with any groups. However, of course, community groups are eager to start and are already having these discussions. That's community empowerment. I welcome it, but be clear, the mandate, as per Council policy, comes today. You approve it. We progress. That's when it will start. And it's important that I say that on the record. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, right, okay. In that case, I'm going straight to the recommendations. Uh, 2.1, agree the consultation mandate in relation to the locations of the inclusive play park investment within Newton Stewart, Castle Douglas, Upper Nisdale and Locker Bay, as detailed in paragraphs 311 to 315 and the appendix. 2.2, agree that in order to identify appropriate community groups to lead each project, the process will, the process will be followed, and that's out, set out in paragraphs 3.7 to 3.10. And 2.3, agree to receive a further report to this committee in November 2018, Paragraphs 310 to 316. Um, now, just before we move on, what do we report on last year's investment and the progress? Uh, back to here again. Will that be included in the next next report? Or yep. what, um, do you want? Could certainly report on on the the, the first three sites uh, as part of that report, uh, Chair. It's also uh, again subject to a report within the business plan as well. I, I think it's actually important to incorporate it in the same report because that lets people see the process and how it was done. Um, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so thanks very much. So we'll agree to that. That's not a recommendation, but uh, we'll ensure that happens. Okay, so in that case, then we'll move on to um, item. When, sorry? <laughs> Dasher's Den. Hi. It sounds like a racehorse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, given the good, <laughs> yeah, given the, the, the um, right, okay, <laughs> right, well, well, I, I think we'll just keep us that to yourself, right? Um, the purpose of the report is to ask members to agree to the disposal for the garage, Dasher's Den, and Port Patrick. Again, Harry and, and uh, Karen are here to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Ian, I thought you might. No, I just uh, it's the, maybe the structure and procedures have changed, but it used to go to the committee. To get signed off first, has it been there? Has the procedures changed? Meanwhile, I've never really seen it come to usually the end, end policy and resources. This is different from what I'm used to coming to the the service committee. That um, Derek, yeah. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Yep, uh, I've no doubt they've changed. I wouldn't be able to say when for how long, but put simply, the council's procedures uh, that we're operating to. Uh, are that they come to the Communities Committee and uh, we're doing that more than happy through governance colleagues to, to advise the member of when that uh, procedure was uh, established, but certainly that's the procedure we're following. Yeah. Sure, uh, Council, September 2017 or 16. Disposal policy. Uh, I, uh, thanks very much for the clarification. So does, is, there, is it bypassed yeah. area committee committee now altogether. I thought you still had to get sight of it. Or is that something we'll go back and have a look at? I mean, we're always, things that the area committee is there for a reason. It certainly was clear. I've maybe missed that. I didn't realise that had been taken out, but I think it's important that if it's not been area committee, it's a clear role to play. I, can, I know it's a small thing in this case, obviously. It is, but I just, I'm, I'm thinking more strategically. If it was Andy or Nestle, I would ask for it to go back. I, that's what I think the, the delegations changed, Ian. Changed to this committee. Um, where before it used to go down that route, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Kind of looking at the older guys in the room, Derek. Procedure we're following. I, 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 I mean, that's the, that's the procedure we are just now. Um, I, given we've got at, uh, one, two, I, two members for Srinrar, I'm or, or which are, I'm, I'm sure, word will filter back. But I, I would think of anything here, given the delegations did change to this committee, this is the right route. But I, I take your point as a, do you send it to the area committee for a, as a noting report? 
you know, would you really want that, Ian? No, I, I'll take it offline. I just, I just didn't, I've been caught out in regards to the, the, the policy change. So it's not that long since. It doesn't seem that long since we had two or three of them at Area Committee and Andy Elnestiel, and I thought we were still following that process. Clearly it's changed. OK, I, I take your point. So I, I'll ask Claire offline to, to, to just to verify this is the right route and, or if it has to go to the Area Committee because this is going to happen more and more, I would suggest. So we need to find out now, yeah? So, OK then. Um, so are we... Uh, asked to agree that Garage Dasher's den is surplus to the needs of the community's directorate and should be disposed of in accordance with the Council's disposal and acquisitions policy as set out in paragraphs 3.3 .3 and 3.6. Happy? Good. Thank you very much. 22, we're getting through this, guys. Um, capital investment strategy, land asset class monitoring. Members are as a uh, report provides members the latest monitoring position. Again, it's uh, the same team, uh, Harry and Karen, uh, and in the ad. Oh. Um, go straight to questions, David. Uh, it's on the appendix, page 414, Nisdale Cargan Bridge player a replacement. About awaiting legal advice and title deeds, Marcel, Rob and Ian, who attend the meeting regularly, this has been dragging on for a wee while. What was brought up at the meeting last night, me and Rob attended, they've already had two tenders received for the play equipment, it's, and the birds are going through in a scoring process. And what they are frightened of now, if this isn't done, would they have to go back through a two-month procurement thing? Because this money was raised, apart from what they got from this deal there, the committee, this was raised on their own by a certain member of the community council, Emma Curry. And I've, I don't like bringing this up, but I think it's dragging its feet on too long, because this is a major project. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm very conscious, um, and I've had a number of discussions with Emma, as, ha as had the Community Assets Manager for Nisdale, uh, in terms of uh, trying to accelerate this. Um, members might be aware uh, that uh, this piece of land f fell into a, a status of non-ownership uh, following the, uh, the uh, demise of uh, Robinson and Davidson. Uh, and we've had to go through a, a quite arcane procedure to try and establish the council's rights to ownership of the land. It's currently sitting uh, with um, the registers of Scotland, uh, and it's been with them for a number of months, having, uh, having advertised the council's intention to apply for ownership. We're now formally uh, awaiting registers of Scotland uh, permission uh, to take the land into the council's ownership. Uh, I asked for the urgency of this to be emphasised to Registers of Scotland when it was passed to them uh, in June, I think it was. Uh, I've, on a couple of occasions since, re-emphasised that uh, on the basis that the, the group has time-limited funding. Uh, and I do share uh, their understandable frustration in this. Uh, there is a, I think uh, I understand now that, that uh, the Community Assets Manager is meeting with the group to look at the tenders next week. Uh, and as soon as we possibly can, then we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead. But uh, I'm afraid uh, registers of Scotland are very difficult to uh, uh, move at any speed at all. Thank you, Chairman. On the same point, um, I recognise that the registers are, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the law and, and the make grinds very slow and incredibly fine. Um, Chairman, it might be sensible, perhaps, for you to write to the keeper. Um, on behalf of the committee, um, just emphasising the council's view that this needs to be expedited, given it's a community group, the importance of our policies and community being permanent, they've raised a lot of money, the funders will start to consider that they would want it back if they don't get on with it. I mean, it ought to be a fairly easy thing. Um, I mean, we're voluntarily taking the land, you know, it's, it shouldn't be so incredibly difficult. Um, I wonder if you'd be prepared to do that, I think it might help. <coughs> Thanks very much. Anyone else? Uh, uh, Andrew and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. It's with regard to the Hollywood Cemetery replacement gates. That's uh, private property as well as the council. Would that be a shared cost or do we have to meet the full cost? Um, I have to say, Chair, that is news to me, so I'll have a look into that and uh, come back to the members separately. Pick up offline, Andrew. Yep. Okay, Jim. Page 410, where we're carrying out a 100 year restoration. Uh, 
I lost the, 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 the English graduate from the university, maybe comment on that, uh, Deputy Leader. Um, I, I think that's an English, uh, um, basic English uh, error in terms of the... There is a, a serious point I want to raise uh, as yeah. well. I, I passed on a request about Morton Cemetery. Apparently, there are trees growing in it that are moving headstones and then see we're carrying some work at Morton Cemetery. So it might be prudent to deal with the work at the same time. And I hope your honour your restoration goes well. Uh, absolutely. Um, okay, that'll get dealt with you uh, off offline, uh, Jim, your comment there. Okay, that everything here. So we'll uh, move to recommendations. And that's 2.1, note the financial and physical progress on the projects. 2.2, note the project to restore the early Galloway monument has been deferred to 2019-20. And projects brought forward from the reserve list are in paragraph 3.73.8. And we need to add a 2.3 in there is for the, uh, the chair to write to the, um, we can fix up a, a letter um, to basically G up the process. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So we move from there. That's the end of 22, 23. Any other business as indicated earlier? Um, I've agreed to take an urgent item of business. Um, I think there's, Copy's got to get circulated here. Um, basically, um, whilst I, I wouldn't want to rush the members, um, the soup's getting cold, um, but it's a uh, 100 years, it's a big day. It's, it, it's, it's big for this country, but it's absolutely massive for the country that was liberated uh, at, at 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to, to read it. Mm -hmm. Are we are we happy to move on, folks? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's not much to say here. It's... Uh, as I say, it's a hundred years, a huge thing for the people in uh, the town who are asking us to send a representative. Um, personally, I'm for it, and I'm just looking at the, the only maybe a slight amendment I might ask you to consider is if you look at the cost of the trip, you know, the airport parking, the, the flights, uh, accommodation, um, is, and then the transport to and from Charles de Gaulle, to Marcuses. Um, what we haven't included in there either, of course, is the member subsistence, because I'm assuming there's going to be a, a fair degree of hospitality from their end, because uh, that's what they, they got when they were here. But we wouldn't expect a member to travel in this country and then no eat, because that's, that's not included. And then can, can you just keep me writing that clear? Uh, just to be clear, you aren't um, approving the level of um, expenses that a member can claim. It's just providing the authority for those expenses to be claimed as the trip would be in a two Right. You're not, you're not saying that it wouldn't include subsistence. So the normal governance process applies for uh, our day-to-day -day subsistence mm -hmm. when, when they're there? Okay, that's clear. Thanks very much. That makes sense. Okay, Provost. Sorry, thank you, Chair. I'm not entirely comfortable with this. Um, we are twinned with Gifhorn as well, and as provost, I get invitations to go. There's delegations come over here. There's one coming over shortly from Gifhorn, and I get invitations to go over there and other places that are connected with Dumfries that we'd like the provost to go over. And I am politely declining because we have an anti-poverty strategy. We've, we're tackling poverty in the region, and I'm just not comfortable with the appropriateness of using those funds to go over. I'm afraid. I mean, this is apolitical. I mean, there's, there's no whipping anybody here. That you, you, your own conscience will decide which way you want to go. Now you're entirely entitled to be like that. Um, I've got Jim Dempster and Andrew. Is 
<laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic towards us simply because of the, 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 the event and the relationship and, and of course there's the, the military a, a symbolic nature of the thing. Are both members in, intending to go? In that case, I'll let both members are no intending to go. Just clarify the position for all members. The indications are the chairman is not intending to go, but the vice chair would if this committee approved. Thank you, chairman. Because I was going to say uh, the Armed Forces champion might be a good representative to go as well. I would certainly like to see the region represented. Now, I understand it's Wigtonshire, but uh, the Armed Forces champion certainly is a role to play. Thank you, Chairman. The uh, just to confirm, uh, informal soundings uh, in anticipation of that uh, request coming forward uh, is firstly, the invitation came to the Chair and Vice Chair. Secondly, the informal discussion with the Armed Forces Champion has confirmed he's unavailable at that time due to prior commitments for obvious reasons. Thanks very much. Andrew? I'm like-minded with Jim. I, I believe that we should have representation going across. Just recently we had uh, quite a debate about being corporate parents, etc. And I think that since this is the year of the young, we should be looking at sending one of our corporate, uh, our, sorry, yeah, one of our uh, children across to give them that opportunity. If you look in the report, it shows how we've had a lot of uh, young involved in various other activities within this twinning. And I think it's, I think it'd be quite apt to, to you know, include one of our uh, young, looked after children. Thank you, Chairman. Obviously, uh, the first priority here is uh, the, the twinning with Newton Stewart. So certainly on that basis, it's something that uh, if members are like minded, we would certainly uh, look into that. Obviously, timing uh, are all factors that have to be considered, but be assured if that was the will of the committee, we would certainly do our level best uh, to progress that request. And that in, in no doubt would certainly add value and further extend the relationship uh, with the Newton Stewart community and uh, their uh, friends in Marasus. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of looking across at David, and uh, he uh, has an invitation going to other groups. Um, maybe a question I would maybe think we should ask, rather than assume that it's our job, they've maybe already been in touch with the school, or um, we the organised civic dignitaries in Newton Stewart. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. To the best of our knowledge, that's not happened. No. But we'll certainly uh, clearly uh, seek that clarity before proceeding. And you're, you're absolutely right that uh, we wouldn't cut across that. But certainly informal indications have suggested that that's not in place just now. So we'll certainly follow that up. So the, the logical follow on for that then would be is are we, if it comes to the recommendations, are we agreeing? How do we find, how do we fund that? But, you know, the, the other kids, Jim. Sure, do we not just delegate the officers to ensure that the uh, vice chair goes accompanied by an appropriate individual nominated by this council and agreed by a area committee or, or whatever it is you do to make sure we're represented and that it's a formal arrangement dealt with by officers? Um, but my, my worry here is the, the, what we're asked to consider and agree is the level of elected member attendance. Okay, this is a move away from that. Um, and I think we, we need to treat it with a bit of caution, I have to say, although it's admirable, right? A de degree of caution here. Um, would it be the school, for example, um, or would it be the GKM's award or whatever organization has been asked to go? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, we shouldn't have been a because... raffle about who goes. If it's elected member a representation, then it should be somebody from Wigney Committee to support yeah. or, or, or go with the vice chair. In the event of anybody being available, some other elected member, a, a responsible member of the, uh, or the well, leader, well, deputy leader, whoever goes, to make sure we have appropriate representation from yeah. this council to a formal event. Yeah, I, I mean, let's be let's be clear. Just two seconds, Ian. Let's be clear. The invitation is to the council. Yeah. Uh, just to get clarity in regards to my, my reading of it was, was it's the vice chair of Wigton Area Committee after the comments that the chair has removed his 
is itself as an option, uh, being Councillor Sloan. So that I've and I've read it going back to the points that I made. It maybe we need the actual figure, seven hundred pound for that for that visit is what I'm saying. To get without any other expenses, the bare minimum, but it looks like it'll be seven hundred pounds. So that's what I think we're making the decision on at two point two. It's whether or whether or not to send it. It's no between the the leader or the deputy leader of the council. I think that would be a completely different committee. It wouldn't be here. It'd be the full council or even delegated authority. But certainly, that's my understanding. So we get clarity in regards to that, Chairman. That's the question. Is that is it seven hundred pounds? Two questions. And is it the vice chair of Wigton Area Committee? Um, that's my view. Right. That's that's the question we've been asked here today. I'll just come in. There. Thank you, Councillor Killers. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, the clarity is that uh, this is indicative figures, uh, so uh, that's the indication that we have. Uh, we're absolutely clear that the Chair and Vice-Chair got the invitation. The Chair has indicated they would not intend to, to take up the invitation as much as they appreciated it. The Vice-Chair would, and therefore, at this point, all we are dealing with is the request uh, for the Vice-Chair. Uh, clearly, that the separate issue is a matter between the twinning organisations that we have had no involvement with purely the request for the two members. Okay, I'm going to move on to the recommendations then. Um, because Chair. We're, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Andrew, we, 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 we can invite people on behalf of another organisation. I don't think it's inappropriate to go back to the invitees and say, look, this is the scenario that we have. We take our corporate parenting seriously. We believe that a lot of these people lost their lives for the future and for the next generation. This is the next generation. I don't think that people would deny that. Well, well listen, we're here to answer uh, and to vote on to decide on the paper in front of us. Right, I'm not putting in uh, imponderables because we're only corporate parents for children who are actually, um, not all children, by the way, to be corporate parents. The, the, the term corporate parent, I know I don't want to get any semantics we here, but the term corporate parent has a very special significance as no doubt the ex cherry social work would agree with me, right? It's for a, a very select group of PA children that we're the corporate parents. Um, yes, but I do appreciate we have a responsibility to all children, absolutely, but we're not corporate parents for all children. So are we recommending, are we, we've noted the, the, the invite, right? And consider and agree the level of elected member attendance at the Mercusis twinning event to mark the centenary of armistice. Are we agreed? Ian? I'm just looking at it and just come back to some of the comments we made earlier. And we keep talking about poverty with a couple of items up today as well. I would, uh, 2.1, I would move it to 2.1. We know that the Vice Chair Nats had, a, had an invite and that's it. I'd leave it there. I wouldn't have even gone anywhere near 2.2. I would just stop at 2.1. I'll propose um, that. Are, we I'll propose got, are, we that. Got, are we serious? You've got a vote about an armistice thing? It's not about an armistice thing. I, I can well, move it along. Any of the members of the council are welcome to go along. The chair and the vice chair, it's whether it's funded by the council that it costs £700 for that person to go along. With times of austerity and poverty, we're still aware of that, Chairman. So, I, may, I mean, I propose with, with different views support armistice, support the armed forces in every way I possibly can. And I do turn up to a lot of events. But it's, we're talking about something different here. It's whether the council is willing to pay seven hundred pounds for that for a, a elected member to go over to France for for the, the level of time that's been asked. Well, I'm happy to move that we do fund it. Uh, um, agree two point two. Does anybody want to second me? Thanks, Rob. Chairman, it's the centenary. It's the centenary. Yes. And without wanting to engage in cultural stereotypes, if it's a big thing here, it's an even bigger thing there. I'm happy to second it. Thanks very much. Do you want to move an amendment? I made that proposal, Chairman. Could be on the one, but I do propose I move that as an amendment. Do you get a seconder? Andrew, okay. Right. There's a motion um basically to to note uh, recommendation two point one and to for recommendation two point two agree that um, there's one member, the vice, being yeah. the Vice Chair of the Waiting Area Committee, um, given approval to attend the event. The amendment um, is basically just to note Recommendation 2.1. Okay. 
Okay. Right. Okay, going to the vote then. Chair. Motion. Vice Chair. Stain. Councillor Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Davidson. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Justy. Amendment. Councillor Harry. Councillor Ingalls. Councillor Little. Abstain. Councillor Stitt. Councillor Tate. Councillor Wilson. Amendment. Councillor Wood. Motion. And Councillor Young. Motion. Motions carried. Eight votes to four with two abstentions. Thanks very much. Um, very quickly, we want the item uh, 24, and the uh, members are asked to consider the adoption of a resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A, para, uh, subtitles 4 and paragraph 9 of part 1 of the schedule 70 to the Local Government Scotland Act of 1973. Have we agreed? Okay, thank you. Um, we have an exempt report. There's nobody else in the room. Shouldn't they be? Um, is it off in the room next door? <laughs>